Good morning from Council Chambers. We're turning the live streaming on. Thank you. Well, good morning, joyful people. Nice to see everyone. And uh, would like to call this meeting to order. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nikorasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. I will do a roll call of council members. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning. All right, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. I'll move that the February 22nd, 20, uh, 2023 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of 7.1, monthly update on operating, bud operating budget amendment 12. Item 9.3, exploration and major event bid, uh, which is kept in private. And then replacement attachment of item 9.3, exploration and major event bid, attachment one. Second. Okay. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote for the adoption of the agenda. Yes, for me. Thank you. We're just waiting for one more vote. Yes, for me. Thank you, we have all the votes. You got everyone? We have all the votes. Okay, please. display the votes please, ads carried. Okay, uh, approval of the minutes, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor So I'll move the approval of the minutes from the January 23rd, 2023 City Council public hearing, the January 25th, 2023 City Council non-regular meeting, the January 31st, 2023 City Council meeting, and the February 6th, 2023 City Council public hearing. Need a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Any errors or omissions in the minutes? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Protocol items. All right, protocol items. Why don't we start with Councillor Rutherford? Were you forgetting my name first? No. <laughs> I was debating between you and Councillor Cartmel. Uh, you should go first, right? So. I won that, I won that mental struggle. <laughs> so thank you so much. I would just like to take a few moments to recognize that today is Pink Shirt Day. 
a day for all Canadians and people from around the world to stand up against bullying. Bullying is a major problem in our schools, workplaces, our homes, and in our city. For one in five kids affected by bullying, it can be hard to know where to turn. But a helping and supportive hand can make a world of difference. For over 80% of the time, bullying happens with peers around, and 57% of the time, bullying stops within 10 seconds uh, when a bystander steps in. Inspired by the courage and determination of two Nova Scotia high school students to stop homophobic harassment and threats against classmates, Pink Shirt Day has become an international movement for change. It is a clear example of how a small action can make a big impact. I hope this inspires everyone to do small but courageous actions to make a big difference in the lives of others. From its inception in 20, 2007 to today, Pink Shirt Day brings attention and understanding to the serious and often devastating impacts that bullying and cyberbullying can have. Um, victims of bullying typically show a loss of interest in activities, more absenteeism, lower quality work. School age kids may skip more classes and avoid going to school at all. There are critical barrier, these are critical barriers for anyone to thrive and reach their full potential. Perpetrators of bullying require interventions to replace socially destructive behaviors with empathy, kindness, and compassion. Wearing a pink shirt in solidarity sends a clear message. I encourage everyone to wear pink today to display support for positive change and taking a stance against bullying. Together, let's build stronger communities by embracing our diversity and letting it be known that bullying in any form is not acceptable. Everyone, regardless of abilities, culture, religion, race, age, ethnicity, or gender identity are welcome here in Edmonton. Donations for pink shirt activities to West, in Western Canada go to local anti-bullying programs and initiatives implemented by partners like Big Brothers and Big Sisters. In 2020 alone, Western Canada supported programs in, impacting nearly 60,000 children. I hope that Edmontonians will show their support for a more kind, inclusive world by celebrating Pink Shirt Day today and learning more about how they can participate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Absolutely very, very important. And I'm pretty sure all of us can relate in our own lives how bullying has impacted us, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome here today uh, Nick Lees and to share with my colleagues and all Edmontonians the story of a remarkable and passionate city builder. Like many Edmontonians, Nick immigrated with little money in his pocket but with lots of hope for the chance to build a prosperous, fulfilling and adventurous life. He has succeeded beyond measure. And like many Edmontonians, Nick took the lessons learned in his early years, the value of a helping hand up, the importance of belonging, the exquisite opportunity to imagine, create, and realize our dreams, and made them a driving force for his life. Nick is a great storyteller, which you might expect for a print journalist, but you may not know how he has used his talent and his platform at the Edmonton Journal to create a voice for hundreds of not-for-profit groups that struggle for recognition and support. He created a loud, resounding, and hopeful voice that the community rallied behind. Charitable causes, from health and well-being to arts to sports, were uplifted by the spotlight he put on them. Being a man of words and actions, Nick combined his passion for volunteering and adventure as inspiration for many unique fundraising initiatives. Running marathons and participating in cycling tours became vehicles for creating attention, raising money, and most importantly, having fun. Ladders, totem poles, boxing gloves, we're all reminders that Nick's fertile imagination for schemes and ideas was at play, helping another deserving group achieve another record fundraising milestone. In his, I can see you laughing out there, I, I, and these made me laugh as well. I'm going to come to that. In his 40 years as a career, in his career as a philanthropist, Nick has directly raised more than 11 million dollars for Edmonton's charitable causes. His commitment has helped create a caring and resilient community. One of Nick's many superpowers is his ability to bring people together to do good. From captains of industry to regular folks, few can deny Nick's pitch for participation and contributions. He is the first person to help out in any way that he can, and that spirit is infectious. He understands and builds on the basic human desire to help others, to belong and show humanity. 
Nick has assembled a loyal support group of thousands who feed and activate his ideas. He has inspired countless aspiring philanthropists, my goodness, to be innovators and adventurers. He has the respect of our entire community. Uh, I'll just speak from some personal experience. Uh, our paths did not cross very often, but uh, the one place they did cross at least once was at the Jasper Van Relay. This was something that my family participated in almost every year for the better part of 20 years, and you were often there. And, uh, you know, I took particular joy in, in participating in that event and others and being able to come back home and read about it in the journal. And, and it, it meant a lot to me uh, because it sort of acknowledged something that I was doing and that I was a part of. And, and you know, there's a certain validation in that when you see, when you see yourself reflected in that. And the other thing that really, uh, that really struck me, Mr. Lees, was when you would uh, get you and some of your friends to carry the ladder in the marathons. And uh, for those that don't know, there's this euphemistic wall that you hit towards the end of the marathon. And so uh, Nick and his friends would carry a ladder to get over the wall. And then they would use that ladder to uh, raise money and hang signs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, really wonderful imaginative work. So uh, from all of us to you, uh, you're surrounded by a number of your colleagues here. It's, uh, you know, it's a real college of, of uh, community leaders that surround you. Uh, we thank you so much for your endeavors and for your contributions. Uh, to our city. You've made it a greater place and we thank you for it. Yes, stand up, Nick. Why don't you stand up and be recognized? Yeah, please. Yeah. There we go. Uh, Nick, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, yeah please come up to the podium. We'll love to. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You just come to the podium so everybody, everyone can I hear you and the public can hear you as well, if you don't mind, please. Yeah. And thank you for your uh, phenomenal work in the community. Uh, our paths have crossed numerous times in, uh, in charity events, right? So it's phenomenal to see your contributions, yeah. Testing seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Um, there's so many good friends here today that have helped me. I, I, I'd miss somebody, so I'm not going to mention him. All this, the first couple of rows, most of them are really, really good friends who've helped me. I can't remind, remember how much you said I might have made over the years, but. It was because... 11 million. 11 yeah. million. Yeah. But th this is the, p the people that really were behind me and uh, put it um, together. Um, I first got going, I think, I was about 18 years old. I was at Hampton Grammar School. The headmaster told me um, he thought I had absorbed as much learning as I was ever likely to in my life. <laughs> and uh, I reluctantly left because I was on the wing of the first 15 at rugby and scored every weekend. But um, I went out into the world and by pure chance, I stumbled on an agency at Heathrow Airport who uh, were a, uh, it was a news agency and in no time I had a flair for, I guess BS really in a way, because I could take, I remember once, um, sitting next to, or walking out to a plane with Paul McCartney of the Beatles. And um, nobody could believe that I put this great big story together about Paul McCartney. I just had a flair for doing that. And uh, he spoke to me about two or three sentences and I managed to get a page out of it. Uh, they thought it was quite amazing. So they, uh, I went on indefinitely for three and a half years working for this news agency, prime ministers, anybody in town, for anybody flying the world I would meet and talk to. And um, I went on to work for the Evening Standard as a crime reporter. I loved covering crime. Um, it was always just a good story and a strange, fast-moving story. And eventually I came to, uh, I thought I've got to get out here and get, go and see the world. So I jumped on a cargo boat one day, sailed to Montreal, coming across Canada. I broke three ribs in a car crash. It was the other guy's fault, I'm almost sure. And uh, I staggered into Edmonton with, um, I think it was like 
the most 50 bucks in a bag. I ended up uh, living with a bunch of students who thought my stories were amazing. And uh, in no time, I somehow ended up at the Edmonton Journal. And um, things like the Beatles were just natural. I just, whoever was flying, get out there, talk to them, get a story. And it would be in the national papers or it would be on the line to Associated Press or you know, a big other, Reuters or somebody. But um, that was a really good uh, background. Um, I'm, getting, I'm getting my, where I was confused. I was in Edmonton. I ended up covering the Supreme Court of Alberta. Um, I got fired for uh, interviewing a centerfold out of Playboy and not coming back. I went to California by, by mistake. It took me some time to get back to Edmonton. Uh, it never did quite work out in Santa Monica, but uh, it, I thought it was worth a try. And um, uh, I've been, I'm still working for the journal. I was up until recently and I've had a minor uh, health confrontation, which seems to be okay. But um, I've enjoyed Edmonton. I, I realized almost immediately when I was here, uh, a bunch of students I was staying with said, let's hitchhike to Jasper for the weekend. I went out to Jasper. I took one look at those mountains and knew I had found another home. And I went on to uh, climb a heck of a lot of you. The, if you drive down that Jasper Banff Highway, a lot of those peaks down there, I've climbed. My highlight in climbing, though, came in 1984, when a good friend of mine who was coming down to see me in a couple of weeks from the Yukon said he was going to climb Mount Logan, Canada's highest mountain, at um, nearly 6,000 feet. And somehow we ended up on the mountain for 23 nights. We ran out of, just about ran out of food, but on the 21st, 20, 21st day, we got hit by a blizzard. We're right on, just under the peak. And I was determined, of course, I was going to climb this damn peak. And um, we sort of got buttoned down. It was minus 70. And the wind, we were splitting up and holding our tent pole. It was blowing like crazy in the wind. And I had taken the, just taken the Forces Arctic Survival Course and built an a igloo wall around the, the tent. We got through. On the fourth day, the sun finally came out again. And we were frozen in there, deep snow and all the rest of it. And um, my buddy Hector McKenzie, anybody who climbs or goes to the Yukon would know Hector. Um, he said, Nick, we have to, to be honest, we have to take a vote on whether we go for the mountain peak, which I was all for, of course, or we go down. The other two guys were married, were kids, and said, let's go down. So we had a very diff difficult kind of time there. But eventually... Um, we went down, and uh, fortunately, we all survived and all the rest of it. But that was one of my highlights, I think. I always remember that and um, look back on my days. I, I knew then that I was probably going to see out my life in Edmonton as I seemed to be hurtling towards it. But um, one of these days, but I cannot believe still we get such good people for mayors in Edmonton. This guy is, I think, just, just amazing. I know a lot of, I've just got to know, I've, I've known Tim Carnell for quite a while. He's a good man. And uh, I've met several councillors this morning just to say hello to, and uh, they've got their heads on right. And I think. We don't need to get anybody else here for quite a while yet. So keep up the good work, ladies mainly. Uh, I'm not sure how that happened, but there you go. Um, we, we're delighted to have you, such a such good, strong ladies with good, strong um, minds. Um, I'm rambling on here. Um, I just want to say that I've loved Edmonton from the word go. I like getting out to, uh, uh, I find I can get to London in nine hours and I watch for the fares and sometimes I can get there for 400 bucks. I go and see my family and see my favorite rugby teams regularly and life keeps on tumbling along and I like to go to London and see, catch the theater a little bit 
But I do, one of the things that made me stay here also is the arts. My mother, I was born in Glasgow, Scotland, and you know, we were very lucky to go to London and get introduced to Covent Garden. So I grew up with the opera and the, the uh, good, good music there. And I, was, I, I loved it when I got here and found out there was such a good opera company, um, good music and all the rest of it. And I'm rambling on, I just want to thank you very much for including me today to come here. I really, I know a lot of people, this crowd here have been fantastic. And I tell you, it was, um, I think it was my uh, mother who once gave me a real uh, lecture. I had, I couldn't find, I talked to Paul McCartney, I'd interviewed him, and I went home and tried to find one of his albums I couldn't and asked my mother where my records were. She says, Nick, you've had those for about three years. It's, um, I gave them to the bazaar at the church, and I thought she gave my record collection. And she says, Nick, you've had those for years. You know the words off perfectly. You don't need the albums anymore. So she gave them to the church, and uh, that was, uh, that was okay, okay, I guess. But that was really one of the things that opened my eyes to helping people. Um, it's, if you get a gang of people, which is what I did, I entered a race and told some of my friends we're going to raise some money for a charity. And it did so well in future years, and especially over here. It was easy to make friends. I found Edmontonians are really great friends. And um, I, it was easy to get a gang of people to run a marathon, cycle back. We cycled back with a totem pole um, from Haida Gwaii to Edmonton, and it now sits in the atrium of... University Hospital, but there's all kinds of things. And it was so easy to get people here to join you and take, do something kind of sporty, cycle, swim, climb. Oh, you know, I've climbed all kinds of mountains, enjoyed it. So if anybody wants to do a little climb this summer, please get in touch and we'll, we'll do it for the community and we'll save somebody or raise some money for a, a hospital or something. Anyway, thank you. I'm boring the heck out of you. I'm sorry. But... but, but I've never been able to speak to city council before. I thought I'd make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for, uh, for sharing some of your uh, life stories with us. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. It wasn't boring at all because uh, you want to see what boring is, stay on for the rest of the day, right? <laughs> Not the next item, though, because next item is very, very exciting. And I'm so honored that this year, Edmonton is excited to host the 2023 Juno Awards from March 9th to 13th for the first time since 2004. Music is, yes. Music is one of the most positive outlets in our lives. It unites us as humans, regardless of our favorite genres, tastes, or styles. It energizes and moves us. And it helps build lasting connections within our community and with the visitors to our city. City of Edmonton is proud to sponsor the Junos along with other sponsors such as Explore Edmonton. Uh, it is my pleasure today to recognize the people who have made this possible, our local organizing committee. I'm especially proud that this is the first time that a host committee has been chaired by two women, and that the committee has been intentional in selecting a diverse membership to represent the many voices in the music industry. This committee has used their voices to plan a thrilling event while also working in partnership with Canadian Academy for Recording Artists and Sciences to plan activities for Edmontonians and visitors to enjoy. This includes the Road to the Junos concerts, which began on February 6th and will continue until February 28th, as well as panel discussions with local artists and performance showcases in the community. We are so fortunate in Edmonton to have the live music scene we do, which is crucial in building a vibrant 
dynamic, and well-connected city. Apart from the vast area of talent in this city, Edmonton is known for its international reputation as a host city when, with an impressive record of hosting some of the best events in the world. Hosting events such as Juno Awards supports our event sport culture attraction plan by having a positive economic impact on our city, increasing tourism, and showcasing the amazing amenities and elements that make Edmonton the special place we all love. This has been no small feat, so I would like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the Juno's host committee who are in attendance or those who are watching via live stream. When I call your name, please stand if you're here with us in council chambers. Co-chairs, Amy Hill and Renee Williams. <laughs> Subcommittee chair members, Anor Proven. I don't see Anor here. Uh, Faiza Ramji. Uh, Catherine Housing. Lynn Whiten. Yes. Mackenzie Brown and Natalie Tate. Well, please give them a big, big round of applause. And the executive team members, Christine Rogerson and Sean Herbert. And from our own city of Edmonton, Rana Bremer and Jenny Renner. <laughs> and from Explore Edmonton, Janelle Janis. <laughs> so on behalf of City Council, I would like to thank you for your commitment in helping make this event possible and for showcasing the talent and vibrancy of Edmonton. And looking forward to seeing you uh, uh, on, on the weekend at, at those uh, number of events. Yes, thank you so much for all the hard work. <laughs> yes, thank you, Councillor uh, Tang. I missed one name. I don't know how I did that, but I did it. Matthew Dimmer. Matthew, are you here? Virtually joining us. See, I have a good eyes on my side. <laughs> cool. And we'll give a big round of applause to Matthew, please. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So that is any other protocol items? All right. Now we go to the boring stuff. Okay. All right, select items for debate. Colleagues, items for debate to be selected. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will select 7.7. .7. So in point seven. Uh, and I can select 9.2 just as I see as it must be selected. 9.2. Uh, yeah, thank you. Councillor Tank. Uh, 7.1. Yes, told that. 7.1. Uh, 8.1. 8.2. 9.1 9 and 9.3. 9.1, 9.3. Councillor Wright. Uh, can I select 7.6, please? 7.6. This is from the committee, so is it for voting purposes or is it new information that arising out of the discussion or? It's, it's to obtain new information rising from questions that I 
Okay. I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have selected 7.1, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, 7.11, 7.12, 7.13, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.17, 7.18, 7.19, 7.20, 7.21, 7.22, 7.23, 7.24, 7.25, 7.26, 7.27, 7.28, 7.29, 7.30, 7.31, 7.32, 7.33, 7.34, 7.35, 7.36, 7.37, 7.38, 7.39, 7.40, 7.41, 7.42, 7.43, 7.44, 7.45, 7.46, 7.47, 7.48, 7.49, 7.50, 7.51, 7.52, 7.53, 7.54, 7.55, 7.56, 7.57, 7.58, 7.59, 7.60, 7.61, 7.62, 7.63, 7.64, 7.65, 7.66, 7.67, 7.68, 7.69, 7.70, 7.71, 7.72, 7.73, 7.74, 7.75, 7.76, 7.77, 7.78, 7.79, 7.80, 7.81, 7.82, 7.83, 7.84, 7.85, 7.86, 7.87, 7.88, 7.89, 7.90, 7.91, 7.92, 7.93, 7.94, 7.95, 7.96, 7.97, 7.98, 7.99, 7.100, 7.101, 7.102, 7.103, 7.104, 7.105, 7.106, 7.107, 7.108, 7.109, 7.110, 7.111, 7.112, 7.113, 7.114, 7.115, 7.116, 7.117, 7.118, 7.119, 7.120, 7.121, 7.122, 7.123, 7.124, 7.125, 7.126, 7.127, 7.128, 7.129, 7.130, 7.131, 7.132, 7.133, 7.134, 7.135, 7.136, 7.137, 7.138, 7.139, 7.140, 7.141, 7.142, 7.143, 7.144, 7.145, 7.146, 7.147, 7.148, 7.149, 7.150, 7.151, 7.152, 7.153, 7.154, 7.155, 7.156, 7.157, 7.158, 7.159, 7.160, 7.170, 7.171, 7.172, 7.173, 7.174, 7.175, 7.176, 7.177, 7.178, 7.179, 7.180, 7.191, 7.192, 7.193, 7.194, 7.195, 7.196, 7.197, 7.198, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99,
Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of items 8.2 and 8.3. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third readings of items 8.2 and 8.3. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20387 and bylaw 20363. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any consular inquiries? No, and reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Uh, request to reschedule reports, none. Unfinished business, none. Now we are on to our first item, which is 9.3, exploration of major event bid, and for which we need to go into private. Do you want to do the uh, oh, yes, we have kids here. All right, okay, before we go into private, I would like to welcome uh, kids from St. Lucie School, and they are here with their teacher, Melissa Panicia, right? Uh, grade six, and your ward representative is Councillor Rutherford from Ward and Ernick. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you here for the whole day or just for the visit, for the morning? Just for the morning? Cool, have fun. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, can someone move that we go into Councillor Hamilton? You have I, the, oh. I can move that we go into private subject to 16, 24, and 25. So section 16, disclosure harmful to business interests, 24, advice from officials, and 25, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of the public body. Second. Who seconded? Please vote. Who seconded that? Sec Councillor Hamilton seconded it. We're just waiting for two more votes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll uh, give about five minutes to clear the, the chamber.
We are open. We are back in public, and I'll uh, ask Councillor Stevenson to take the chair. I have the chair. And uh, I will uh, move that the recommended actions as, as outlined in attachment one of the February 22nd, 2023 Community Services Report, CS01756 be approved. That the February 22nd, 2023 Community Services Report, CS01756 remain private until selection of the host pursuant to section 16, disclosure harmful to business interests of a third party. 24, advice from officials, and 25, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of a public body of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Second. Thank you, Mayor Sohing, Councillor Principe. Um, anyone to speak? Seeing none, I will call the vote. Yes, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Kurt Wells. We're just waiting for a couple more votes. Yes, Councillor Salvador. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes, Deputy Mayor. Please display the votes. And that's carried. I will return the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Now we are on to our second item, which was or is the 7.7, right? Mm -hmm. Residential subclasses and options for other residential phase out select item, second item. Okay, let me pull it up. Okay, Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? Because this is a recommendation from Executive Committee. I so I have to, to introduce the, the item. Okay. Right. All right, so this, there's no recommendation, yeah. I'll introduce the item, right? And uh, uh, we had a very lengthy conversation at the Executive Committee about uh, this particular issue, whether to phase out the residential or not, and uh, there were presentations made from uh, numbers of number of uh, uh, folks from the uh, from the development community, and uh, uh, committee was not able to come to a consensus or near consensus. So, uh, uh, what direction to take? So this item was requisited from committee to council for further discussion and, uh, and uh, action if desired. So with that, uh, there's no recommendations to be moved, right? I'm just kind of from a process point of view, what we, what's the next step on this? Yeah, so you're 100% correct. So there was, this item was discussed at executive committee. There was no recommendation from committee, so it was requisitioned up and uh, the, the item is before you, but there is no motion on the floor. Okay, so I will take the chair back and go to questions, and if there's a desire to have a recommendation? or like um, I don't know that there's a desire from the clerks to have a recommendation, but you might wish to there's, check with your council yeah, colleagues there, how they'd like there, to advance. There's some desire on council colleagues to have a motion brought forward. Okay, okay I'll take the chair back. And I will go to questions. So this was selected by Councillor Stevenson, right? Councillor Stevenson, you selected this, right? Yes, thank you. And maybe, maybe just to clarify our, our process, um, it is typically the practice of council to have a motion on the floor right away. It is a condition of council's bylaw that before debate at city council, there should actually be a motion on the floor that helps focus the debate. Yeah. Great. So, so I will move. Um, that administration return to council with the annual tax rate bylaws that align the other residential and residential tax rates over three years to phase out the other residential subclass starting in 2023 as outlined in the February 15, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01153. Second. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, Second by Councillor Hamilton. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Now we can ask questions on this and questions to administration. Right? Sure, and can I make a brief, brief yes, introduction? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I really appreciate the conversation at, at committee and, and really appreciated the um, presentation and, and discussion that was uh, led by our administration as well. So for me, we, we are working very hard to achieve our city plan goals and uh, encouraging multi-unit housing is, is a really key part of that. So that's higher density housing. Right now, I think our, our tax system has an unfair bias towards um, condos versus apartments. And I think that, that that really detracts from our vision in, in a couple of ways. Uh, the first, it, it creates barriers to us even seeing the type of development we want to see. So higher operating costs uh, as they play out through property taxes can, can decrease investment in the types of housing that we really want to see. I also think it really reduces the, um, the opportunity for housing choice and, and for Edmontonians who maybe aren't able or, or wanting to own property. Um, the current tax regime creates a disincentive uh, for those types of units being provided. I fully, fully appreciate the pressures that uh, Edmontonians are under right now from a, a financial perspective and, and shifting. Uh, so the total amount of tax collected will not change whatsoever, but uh, this proposal would see a shift over time. Uh, the way this is structured, this would result in uh, of four, roughly $4 per $100,000 of assessed value um, over three years. So for someone who owns uh, a $450,000 home, um, which is the average home price in Edmonton, it would be about uh, an additional $15 um, this year and then over the next three years. Again, this is not nothing, but the value that it adds in terms of building towards our city plan goals, I think is is immense. So I will leave it there and look forward to further conversation and debate. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, for the introduction of this item. Uh, now questions. Councillor Tang, please go ahead. Oh, so, well, do the uh, welcome first before I go to Councillor Tang. Uh, we are joined by grade six class from uh, St. Lucie School and with their teacher, Ms. Urso. Did I say it? Yes. And uh, they are your ward councillor. Representative is Councillor Rutherford, Ward Anilnik. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to City Hall. Cool. All right. Keep okay. now, Councillor Dan. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I've been following this conversation a bit at committee, uh, so I'm trying to wrap my head around it, but I guess first to the mover, what would you say is the intent of the policy? Is it really about addressing um, currently, you know, there's this in, in, inequity when it comes to multifamily, is the inequity against kind of end user, uh, or is it really to incent um, development, uh, yeah? Yeah, I, I would say it's both of those things. So both to uh, remove a barrier to development that exists right now uh, and also provide greater equity. Um, I'd also suggest it, it brings us closer to an idea that the property taxes we levy should be reflective of the costs of those properties to the city. So if we look at a 15-story condo building uh, next door to a 15-story apartment building, those are identical built forms in identical neighborhoods requiring identical city services, um, and one of them is paying 15% higher uh, taxes. So, so that, that to me, um, is, is an unfairness in the current regime and something that I think we can rectify. Okay, appreciate that. Um, and I guess, question to administration. And, you know, part of what I'm struggling with, uh, you know, I get the rationale, I get why we wouldn't need to move in this direction. We just went through a fairly intensive budget deliberation. We spend the, we're still spending the time right now to justify the, you know, the tax increase and, and, and explaining a lot of, you know, the nuances in the process with our constituents. Why was this report not, didn't, like, why is this conversation not part of that budget deliberation? So maybe I'll start. Um, when you set a budget, you're setting the whole budget. And so budget deliberations are focused on 
revenues expenditures on the whole. The matter of assessment and taxation is the distribution of the budget that you've established out. And so you need to, if you want to make this move, you need to have this conversation before we bring the tax bylaws in April. Right, but I also understand the engagement in the sector with industry has been going on for the past year, and there was some understanding that it would have came earlier, like in the fall. Um, I just, I guess, I'm just trying to understand the timeline. I mean, I, I understand it's about you know setting the the tax bylaw, but this is also about shifting. Um, I think, yeah, it's it's that shift that that the mover was talking about. So, just. If you can elaborate on that a bit more, it will be it will be helpful. Um, and I guess just to follow on that, you know, why can we have that conversation during SOBA, for example? Just so that it's kind of group with, because otherwise right now this is a standalone uh, taxation budget conversation, whereas. So I just want to be clear, it's not a budget conversation. This, this sure. isn't, this isn't about a budget, it's about the distribution of the budget that's already been established. But there's a tax implication here, I guess. Is, there is, is an implication on residents, depending on whether you are in the residential subclass or you're in the other residential subclass. Um, but I just, I do wanna make it clear that budget is a different conversation. And so while I agree that you need to think about all of the things and the way that they impact citizens, this isn't a budget conversation. This is a distribution of taxes conversation. And we're here today because we're responding to a motion that we got late last year to return with options. Okay. Right. And when was that motion first tabled? Just give me one second. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um, and I also think, um, yes. But I also, you know, if I recall in the budget deliberation, a lot of the discussion also, like, you know, tax implication was very much a, a huge consideration for how we kind of discussed uh, what we need and what we don't need, et cetera. Um, I guess one of the things uh, would the mover consider maybe referring this to 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 a later, because I'm just, I guess I'm, I am worried about the timing of this. Yeah, you know, I, I see value in potentially looking at this as part of uh, spring SOBA. Um, uh, I think that gives us some more tangible things to, to look at. There's also, again, we could be looking at this starting next year as well. It could be another option. And just to answer your earlier question, the motion uh, came from the March 9th, 2022 Executive Committee. Oh, I have, okay. You had said late 2022, but okay. Yeah, that, sorry, no. so it was back in March of 2022. Got it, thank you. Um, all right, thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Um, thank you, so I recall the discussion executive committee and, and part of it came down to um, sort of leveling the playing field, I guess. Um, and, I, and I don't know if spreading the tax burden onto other residential property owners um, really levels it. Um, I think it's more of a case between um, maybe the the condo the condo rental market as opposed to just straight rental properties um, so is there any way that our our tax laws can 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 assess somebody if it if they're not an owner occupied condo owner no unfortunately there is not okay so that kills that idea um, and and then there's yeah, because I mean, in both cases, both the the rental company and the the, the condo rental owner, um, they have the ability to deduct those taxes, or sorry, those property taxes from their their overall income, right? Which which a a regular residential property owner doesn't have that option. So none of us are corporate tax experts, but yes, in general, a corporation can deduct property tax from their income to arrive at net income. Okay, so I'm just wondering how that levels the playing field with the residential property owners. Well, I would go back to the, the intention of property tax is to distribute taxes for the services of running a city, whereas an income tax is a redistribution has has a different purpose than property taxation. And so when we look at it in terms of equity, 
I think we're looking at should a property pay different, and again, this is a policy decision, but should a property be charged a different amount if they're not actually experiencing the services different? The, the other thing I might add is, although the motion before you today it directs three years, um, any amount of time is council's discretion. Also, what is at council's discretion is where the tax incidence falls. So while some of our calculations have looked at the redistribution being entirely within the residential class, there is no reason for that to be the case. The redistribution could be across the entire tax base, including to non-residential. Councillor okay. Wright, if I, sorry, up okay. here, uh, if I just may add one more thing. A committee, a lot of the conversation about leveling the playing field was about competitiveness between our city and Calgary. So Calgary doesn't charge for this, um, and we are really working very hard to attract um, investment uh, to our city, and this is one of the tools that council has from a policy side to be able to help uh, in the space to increase the supply. Okay. All right. Um, and but this report. So this isn't it, this isn't doing it right now. It's for the bylaws to come back at a later date, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. I would like to get some more information then. To proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? Oh, you can't, right? Councillor Nack would have to. Councillor Nack, you have to take the chair. Good. So on the competitive side of things, right, we heard that from the developer development community on at the committee. And I asked my staff to do some analysis as going back to 2019. Maybe we need to go back further into, uh, into that. And that analysis showed that Edmonton created uh, 9,721 new privately owned apartment units since 2019 to 2022 where Calgary only created 8,718 uh, rental units. Calgary actually built more condominium units compared to Edmonton, right? So I'm just trying to understand from a competitive point of view, where, where are we losing if we are building more than Calgary? Uh, I mean, this is to a, uh, Stephanie, to you, maybe uh, this is a very preliminary analysis that we did. Maybe we need to dig deeper into that because I really want to understand that uh, uh, if we are not competitive, then we should be making some changes, right? But if you're building more than Calgary is, then where where's that com issue? I think some of it is real and perceived, Mr. Mayor, and without having a, the ability to look at that analysis in a really in-depth way, I would say that well, part of that analysis also should consider what the demand is. Um, and what the needs are of Edmonton and if they're different than Calgary's or not. So I've, I don't have a, a detailed answer for you. Uh, I know, understand. We just did, and I wasn't able to share this with all council members, right? But uh, I think that's why I'm interested in uh, getting more information and more in-depth analysis, right? Uh, uh, maybe referring this back to uh, a further work might be the right approach at this uh, uh, this time, right? Uh, I, I don't know if I want to get thoughts from, maybe I'll come to you again, uh, Stephanie, is uh, can that analysis, further analysis be done? And uh, we make that decision and uh, after that cons uh, uh, information is considered. Mr. Mayor, I think we could do some further analysis in terms of the, the rental market at a preliminary um, uh, level in terms of demand and supply and what the needs are within Edmonton. But I think at the end of the day, this does come down to a values-based policy conversation for council to have in terms of equity in the tax system and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve through city plan. And do, does your taxation system uh, match the, the policy uh, that you have outlined in the city plan? Yeah, but we cannot see at equity in isolation from other advantages that are given to apartment owners such as uh, you know claiming their taxes against their income which uh, homeowners or private homeowners don't right i think maybe inequity at a municipal level but in a broader things i would say well, someone can argue there's inequity for homeowners, right, uh, at a provincial and federal level taxation system, right? So I, I'm trying to grapple that as well in my mind. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, understood. And I think what we can't do or would be much more challenging for us to do would be to do that taxation analysis because we don't have that expertise in house. But we could do an analysis on understanding demand and yeah. what the mechanisms are for the city to increase demand yeah. or increase supply. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I understand because I, if we can really demonstrate this inequity and also that dealing with this will unlock further rental development, I am absolutely willing to see that. But I don't want this to be a $13 million tax break for, uh, uh, for, for, for developers, right, at the cost of shifting that to, uh, to uh, individual homeowners. So that's my concern, maybe uh, to the mover. Uh, are, you, are you okay that we, uh, we defer this decision to, uh, uh, to a future date once that further analysis is done? Yeah, I think I think that provided that that analysis is comprehensive, yeah. um, because I think that ultimately we need to remember that uh, businesses provide many services in our society, and in this case, housing, um, and they provide housing to Edmontonians who may otherwise not be able to afford homes. Yeah. So, I I think that we need to keep that in mind as well as we as we go through the analysis. All right, I will uh, take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Okay. Uh, I'll go to you, Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. Um, just a few questions. I was actually just going to make an amendment to the, the year it started instead of 2023, 2024, but I'll, I'll just quickly ask a few things. So the, the in my mind, it comes down a lot to the what you put in the GBA plus piece, which is that you've talked on in the GBA plus that um, those who rent their accommodations are more likely to be financially vulnerable than those that own. And to me, that's why, like, you know, I appreciate the conversation about other analysis, but I, I keep coming back to what Ms. McCabe just said and that, that that stat's not going to change no matter the information we get. Now, you could argue that if you were to make that change and make it equal across the board, there's not a guarantee that that will be passed through to those who are financially vulnerable. Is that that's fair to say? I would say that while there is no guarantee, mostly because we don't have a concrete way of measuring such things, we would have to control for all the factors that goes into a supply or demand equation, and it, that's just not possible with the resourcing that we have. What I would say is that this would be an, an incentive or a downward pressure over time. It would be cheaper to do this type of construction in this city, and that inevitably applies a pressure over yeah, time. The market would see, oh, sorry, Mr. Sapp. I was gonna kind of add to that. I think a clear-eyed view of this would be, in the short run, likely not that impact, but over the long run, based on economic factors, you'd expect it will endogenize into the supply and demand. Yeah. Okay. But you're not looking at turning a dial and seeing a change tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. The only other thing I wanted to ask, uh, just around mobile home communities, you, you probably know this question is coming because we talked about it, but the mobile home communities are taxed in two different ways. So the mobile home owner, and correct me if I'm wrong, the mobile home owner is charged at the residential tax rate, and then the property owner who owns the land of the mobile home community is charged at the other residential tax rates. And typically mobile home communities have been some of the lowest socioeconomic conditions, which might be where these stats sort of materialize. Is that is that a correct understanding of how this works? Uh, that's correct, Councillor. So just to clarify a little bit further, that you would also break out the assessment. So the multi-family owner of the, of, the, of, the, of the mobile home community park would only be assessed on their land value, correct. not on the improvements on site, and then that's the multi-family rate. And then the individual mobile home owners are only assessed for their improvement value. So typically those are 100,000, 50, 50 to 100, 150 yeah. at the high end in value, and then they, they'll pay just their, the rate on that amount. So, you know, does that affect how much that multifamily mobile home park owner is charging in rent? It's part of the considerations. Yeah, so, so not, not unlike other rental properties, I mean, when their tax is growing up. What, I mean, I, I've represented Westview Village for, for nine years now, and there's all, it's seemingly there's always been a direct correlation between what the taxes go up, that is how much their monthly user fees go up. Um, and, and so they're being charged at that higher rate, which is feeding into that conversation. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you. That's all, all my questions. I'll just uh, I appreciate that there might be a separate motion to amend. My preference would be to uh, proceed, but just to amend that motion to change 2023 to 2024. So I'm going to make that amendment, please. I, I consider it friendly if the assembly does. So just to clarify, starting in 2024 for three years. Correct. Yeah. Everything's the same except the year starting date. Yes, friendly, friendly, friendly. Yep. Friendly. Okay. Okay. Uh, getting on with questions. Uh, where I go? Here I go. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to pick up where the mayor uh, was going, you know, talking about sort of a, a comparison or analysis uh, with Calgary, a few of the items brought up in executive committee were also things like garbage collection costs and that, that uh, really, I think, sort of started to muddy uh, the issue for me. So I'm just wondering, um, maybe to the mover, it would make sense to have a jurisdiction again, not just of Calgary, but of other Canadian municipalities, uh, so that we can see what they're doing, uh, what the impact is, and uh, help inform us to ensure that we are right sizing the numbers here. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Paquette. I think, um, you know, it's always interesting to see what other jurisdictions are doing. The only hesitation I think is that um, my understanding is that this is a fairly unique thing that okay. we have. Well, the reason I ask is because the 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 main thrust of the of the conversation back was that um, Edmonton wasn't competitive, and it was based on a bunch of different metrics which we haven't compared, and so we don't know if we're competitive or not, frankly. Do we? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, you know the the ease of comparing to Calgary is that we have some some similar uh, baseline in terms of um, being able to to more easily uh, parse out the different factors. So you know, for example, if we were to compare ourselves with Vancouver and Toronto, I think that that starts to bring in other you know other dynamics that might be harder to to um, untangle, I guess, in terms of the, the, the overall influences and impacts on that. But I mean, I think your overall point in terms of um, understanding the tools that we have available to us to make our city more attractive for the type of investment we want to see to realize city plan, I think there's value in that. Yeah. Okay. So to administration then. Um, in the in that conversation executive committee, I mean, it was pretty clear that we simply didn't have the answers for some of these things. And uh, while I understand the intent here, I think that, would it be, actually I, I, actually, I don't know how to frame this question because it's more of an opinion. So Mr. Mayor, maybe I'll back off for a little bit, but um, uh, I guess in the, in the form of a question, wouldn't it be helpful to, be able to go to residents uh, who may potentially be taking on this share of uh, of the taxes. Um, wouldn't it be prudent to do that legwork first so that we can explain it to our residents? So, Councillor Paquette, I'll maybe ask Ms. Watt to weigh in here, but um, we did, as part of our engagement, speak with residents. Yes, I know you spoke with residents, but if this decision goes through, I don't have the information to prove the concept. And that's kind of uh, concerning to me. So I'm just, I'm wondering, how, is there proof of that concept then that I can take to my residents? Sorry, I'm maybe just misunderstanding or not clear on what you mean by proof of concept. Okay. Um, the 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 idea that we're not competitive and the idea that doing this will uh, incent uh, more builds that will uh, benefit renters and overall benefit the city of Edmonton. I don't have that proof to take to my residents, do I? 
So I, I, I'm just gonna, I think it would be very hard for us to prove that something's gonna happen because it's indicative of so many different things. So maybe I would just parse it out into a couple of components. Um, when we, in terms of competitiveness in the subclass and the, the, the question around the distribution of taxes, we are one of the only municipalities that has an other residential of this okay. nature. But if your factor. question is around all of the other things that make us competitive, that is a much larger piece of work that I think we would need some very clear direction on what you would like us to look at. Yeah, and I think we should give that clear direction before making a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, so just a few questions. So maybe just to the mover to start. Um, so this would be phased in over three years. Uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit on why the three years? Is there, I don't know, maybe a five year? Because um, I'm, I'm hearing concerns from colleagues around uh, what that might mean for uh, the tax burden on Edmontonians. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I think for me the most important thing is that we just we do um, phase this out uh, and and if that takes a bit longer I think that's all right my understanding is that if we move to a five-year phase out it would be about two dollars uh, per one hundred thousand dollars of assessed value so so again that would be more in the eight dollar range uh, a year which I uh, for for an average home which I think um, is is much more negligible my only thought with a, a, a bit of a shorter timeline is again just recognizing that we do, we're, we're still recovering from the pandemic, there's an opportunity for a bit of an investment boost. And so I felt that the three year um, kind of balanced those two things. So, so easing the potential impact, easing the transition while also providing a bit of a, a jump start for our residential development sector. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense. Um, I appreciate that answer and maybe, you know, I'm hearing a desire to have uh, a bit more data information around the implications of this change. And I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think that could be a good way forward. But just to be clear, this is this has been a long standing conversation. This was two administration. Haven't we been trying to off ramp this for decades at this point? Um, on and off at least. Uh, yes, the conversation has been going on for at least a decade and there was moves to um, sunset this uh, quite a long time ago and then that was paused. I think the struggles other councils have had have been around what this council is also struggling with, which is they have clear intent of where they want this to end up, but um, a challenge with actually seeing that as evidenced in, in the economy because it isn't something that we will know for sure has shown up. So we are trying to focus it a little bit more on what is equitable. Right. Yeah, and I guess the thing that I'm struggling with, um, I think in the past there's been an expectation that we'd be seeing immediate results and that uh, you know that would be reflected in rental rates right away. I, I am not under that illusion. I think that this is a structural change that we'd be making that literally over a matter of decades will, will increase supply overall. So like, is, is my assessment correct? Um, in that the time scale with which we're talking about here? I would say that your assessment is correct. The other thing I would note is that on, on the tax side, there's nothing more we can really do to advance city plan goals without sunsetting other residential. If we are interested or if council is interested in pursuing density classing in some form, we need to not tax a high density class of properties more highly than a low density one. Yeah, yeah, um, that that makes sense. And then, um, no, that I think that answers my questions. Um, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I have contemplated, I, was, I had drafted it at executive and I think I would like to put a referral motion on, on the floor. 
I debated this could be based on what happened yesterday, but I, I think it is, it is worth putting on there. So, um, Madam Clerk, can you get the referral back motion yep. up? So just as we're putting it up, just to clarify, the motion would be to refer the item, but since there's also a motion on the floor, unless that motion is withdrawn, the motion that's on the floor goes with it to admin, and then when the report comes back, the motion that's currently on the floor, not that is not, the referral motion comes back on the floor. So if that's not helpful, it would be good to get that clarity now. Mm. What is the referral? What is the content of the referral? I don't We're know. We're just going to put that up on the okay. screen right yeah. now. We've got that for yeah. you. I mean, I, I, unless it's changed from the wording in the... Oh. Yeah. Can you, uh, meantime, in the, it's yeah. in the read it in? So Yeah, or, so... Uh, that the February 15th, 2023 Financial Corporate Services Report be referred back to administration for a more comprehensive analysis on rental competitiveness with other municipalities and report back on all tools council can consider to enhance Edmonton's rental competitiveness. Okay, so then... Uh, Do we need a second? <laughs> uh, I'll second that. Uh, the, so if I understand from clerk's point of view that the Councillor Stevenson's motion would be better to be withdrawn, right? So then the ref report can be referred back because the Councillor Rutherford says to refer the report back, right? Yeah, so technically a referral motion trumps an original motion on the floor. I was just highlighting so that everybody's aware of the process. The motion is to refer the item. You can't refer a motion to okay. the administration to make a decision on. Okay, that's a so the, if the referral yeah. passes, then Councillor Stevenson... So, her motion goes with the report, and when it comes, when this report comes back to council, for your clarity, the motion that Councillor Stevenson made is your starting point of debate. Okay. So, if that is not helpful, and that's not what the assembly wants, council might want to consider doing something with the motion on the floor currently, um, before Councillor Rutherford actually moves and seconds gets okay. a seconder for her referral. Want to get sense from Councillor Stevenson so what your appetite to withdraw this, and then uh, the report will come back. At that time, you can consider making this. I guess I don't. I don't see any harm in having the motion stand. Like it doesn't seem like that creates any challenges. But that becomes the starting point yep. then, right, for Absolutely. discussion. Right? And that's okay. I just wanted to be okay. really clear okay. so that council is that knows. Based on, based on that, okay. Well, based on that information, I think I will withdraw, and then we can just vote because I, I think we need to, again, same as arguments for yesterday, let's just make the decision and give that clarity, and okay. then I can make this a subsequent. So um, then I mean, if, for if that's the case, like, I, I'll withdraw it if that's the... I don't think that would be a friendly withdrawal. Okay. 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 All right. So then better process will be... Keep focused on Councillor Stevenson's motion. Uh, if this is defeated, then Councillor Rutherford can make her sub, uh, a subsequent, right? If this passes, then there's no subsequent. There would be nothing to prefer back yeah. because action's yeah. already been taken. Got You're okay. correct. Got it. Okay. Okay. And I thoroughly discussed this at Executive, so I have no questions at okay. this time. All right. Thank you. Councillor Jans. Thank you to administration. I guess um, following an exec, one question I was left with is why are these multi-unit rentals not taxed at the same rate as a business? Like why are we even calling them residential? Because their use is residential and um, that's the way the, the legislation works. It, it, it is entirely dependent on the use of the space and if the space is being used to sleep in, it becomes a residential property. So just to clarify, so, Councillor, you, you would have to classify it as a residential class. What the rate is, is within Council authority. So what about hotels? Where is the line if I rent an apartment for a month or two months or six months? When does it become a multi-unit residential and not a hotel? Maybe so I'll I can throw it to that. Cam Ashmore here, yeah. I can answer that, Councillor Jans. So the, the line in the sand is actually written into the legislation and it essentially says that when it is a unit that is intended for permanent living accommodations, it becomes a residential dwelling. So apartment buildings are designed for extended living accommodations, which are could be permanent, whereas hotels are designed for shorter 
there are some times when there's um, hotels that are more like an apartment building and that is where the line gets a little bit grayer. But for the most part, if somebody's renting there and has the ability to extend their stay on a permanent basis, it's a residential unit. Okay. Um, I think my other question then was, so is the converse not true then that if we are believing that an adjustment to the multi-unit residential in their taxation would help improve the business case and their affordability? Okay, what happened here? It's noon. <laughs> so why don't we just take a break here now? That's a great idea. All right, we'll come back at 1.30. Until then, we are on the recess. Okay. We'll start Michael's time again. Yeah. We're going to log back into the meeting and just confirm what happened, although we don't really know. We just break for lunch.
Shall we? I can reforward it to you. I still have it in my um Yeah, and you can Okay. Are we ready? We are very, very, very ready. Okay. Would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. There she is. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Cartmel said he'll be in and out, so we'll be back. Uh, Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay. All right, so we are on, oh, I need to sign into this store. Here we go. Okay, so I think in order to kind of expedite this and uh, there's a desire that uh, we uh, and Councillor Stevenson is okay that we withdraw this motion from her and then a subsequent motion be entertained you can speak to the subsequent as wish to whether support or not uh, I think there's also a desire from the, on the administration to undertake some further analysis on this, right? So, yeah. So based on that advice, Councillor Stevenson, you're okay to uh, withdraw this? Yes, and I think, I think I'd like to I have some questions around the referral. But no, of course, of course, of yeah. course, yeah. Is everyone okay with the withdrawal? Okay. No. No? No. You want to vote? Uh, I'm no. Okay, well, here we go then. We don't, we won't withdraw it then. Okay, all right. Okay, then we'll go back to the order of uh, speakers. Uh, Councillor Prince Bay. Sorry, could we go back to Councillor Jans because he was very rudely cut off when the meeting yes. ended? We did not cut him off. Technology <laughs> cut him off. But he still didn't get his full time. Yeah, yeah technology cut him off, right? So, <laughs> Councillor Jans. First. First, first, you took away my voice. Now you're taking away my YouTube connection. Mm, go ahead. Do you have two? Yeah. Uh, we'll start your time all over again. I actually, go ahead. No, I actually, I actually said, like, like I, as it stands, I can't support this motion. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'd be happier with a much longer runway. But that's that's all I had to say. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Now, Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you had discussed about, you know, like maybe um, uh, renters would not see a relief in rental rates yet, but possibly in the future due to this, possibly. But would it not just be from the expected increase in supply? Would it not just be because of the increase in supply, which therefore would make rates lower? Anton uh, is whispering at me sticky prices. So I think you're exactly on the right track, Council and Principe. Rents are generally set as a consequence of supply and demand. We are also hearing that Council is very interested in creating more affordable housing. And certainly by increasing supply in any way would produce a downward pressure on prices. That's, that's simple economics. Um, reducing this tax would be one of those downward pressures. So your increase in supply would be likely a consequence and that would result in a lower equilibrium rental price. Anton, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm just again, just to stress that when you're looking at immediate rental changes, obviously that's not gonna be the bigger question. The bigger question is st structurally, 
what are we looking at changing? Is it going to impact it over the long run? I think even at the committee meeting, some of the developers there were saying that they didn't expect it to have a short term, term impact, but they saw it as being a potential incentive for them to do more development. And that's what they said in that meeting. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was more of a supply demand, not really necessarily that the developer or the builder is going to pass along that saving to the renters is just a supply and demand. Over the long term too, right, you will have those situations where as costs escalate, uh, will they have to do the same rent increases given that they now have this reduction? Exactly. So it, yeah. again, it builds in over the long term. Do they, do they come down? Maybe not, but do they go up as quickly? Maybe not, right? And I would just add that we, we um, don't have the ability to directly influence how rents get set. A uh, developer may choose, a, a rental building owner may choose to pass it directly on. That's really their decision. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Hamilton, you haven't had a first round yet. Good. Good. Um, I, yeah, uh, okay, I'll, I'll ask some questions. Um, Mr. Sabo, in our taxation um, sort of framework, our schema, is is one of the principles being agnostic to ownership models? Is it is it about ownership or is it about land use? Like, if we're starting from scratch. If we're looking at, and this is also just talking about the legislation, we don't look at ownership of property as part of the consideration. We're looking purely at an ad valorem market value assessment. What is the value of the property? And based on the value of the property, what would be the appropriate and fair tax amount to provide to that property? But the other residential class is not agnostic to ownership. It is, in fact, something, and going back to some of the debate that's happened about this before, it, it is, in fact, about um, sort of weighing, weighting um, the uh, tax, taxation um, in, within the residential class on a different, on, on an ownership model, correct? Correct. So right now there is an element of tax policy. So this is yeah. council tax policy in, ingrained into our current system that says we believe a 15% uh, premium is appropriate for other residential. That's not assessment theory. Assessment would just tax everything at the same mm -hmm. value, same rate, just based on market value. There's an existing policy, a standing policy that says we believe this 15% premium is justified. Um, but it doesn't, for instance, apply to condominium owners or homeowners who rent out um, properties, regardless of whether it's an apartment style or, or high rise style uh, or a duplex or even a single detached residential home. That's correct. All right. And it doesn't apply to those people who might own 5, 10, 15 of those types of properties, provided that they are not classified as a a single multifamily residential dwelling. That's correct. In fact, there are some examples where you'll have a whole building owned by one property owner who's just condominiumized to avoid the differential but is getting the lower rate. And uh, and yet, those people could own it I like under a corporation. They could still take advantage of the many um, uh, advantages or, or be vulnerable to the disadvantages of that type of ownership model. But we have no transparency into that. It's very difficult for us to look into ownership uh, and trying to determine taxes based on ownership. All right. So um, that being said, uh, our entire so and and uh, we could probably have quite a, a, a good debate on this. The property tax model is is based on land use and the typology of land use. Correct. I would say it's based off the fair market value of the property. Yeah. Which will, use will absolutely have a component to that fair market value. Yeah. Is there, I'm, so, uh, and, and it's become a bit of a proxy on the wealth tax, to be honest, correct? That, that it's, you know. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. The moment you start introducing any form of tax policy, council is now re-litigating what is the appropriate distribution. Should it be not just purely based off of market value? Should it be based off some other factors? And so distribution or do we have some policy um, outcomes that we're trying to achieve uh, and those policy outcomes trump the, the distribution that's, that's based off assessment? So those are typically the reasons you would use tax policy, either to achieve specific council objectives or to change the distribution based on a different metric of what you believe to be equitable 
which is not something that we measure through the existing system. Right. Uh, <laughs> Mouthful. I, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, this reminds me so much of the separation distances uh, conversation that we had, which is very different, but very the same, very much the same in that we, I think that there was a, perhaps a reason for this policy to exist at one point, but it has, um, but it's to, it's, it's using one tool um, to accomplish something that is really outside the scope of what taxation or what say land use zoning is meant to actually accomplish. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I think during the, in the report as well, we kind of make this point that if you're looking at, again, this kind of conversation about uh, just pure distribution, assessment value uh, way of doing things, there should be no rate differentials. That does add the complication about why is there a rate differential for non-residential. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside for a moment, what we often look at as a, a valid argument for tax rate subclassing is servicing. What does it cost to service those areas? And if there is a legitimate case to be made that there is a lower cost of service high density, uh, then that could be a case to be made. Again, this is now going outside of assessment. Now you're saying there's other reasons we want to take into consideration, either policy or distribution reasons. But there is a case to be made there about cost of service is lower. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Can you move the second round, please? I'll move the second round. Second. Second by Councillor Nack. Please vote. Um, yes. We're just sending the vote out. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Yeah, I didn't want to make that. Make sure to say yes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm curious about that initial policy objective. So this was started back in 1974. Um, what was the intent of the policy at that time? Uh, it may actually predate that. Oh, it is okay. very much a historical piece that's sort of a carryover from the very early days of property taxation in this province. Um, the intent behind it is probably lost a little bit along with a lot of the intents behind the policies at that time. However, what I can say is we are one of the very few municipalities of our size that retains this in this province. Uh, Calgary did remove theirs in the early 2000s based on many of the, the discussions that you're hearing right now, including the similarities between a condominiumized under one owner and a, a single title under one owner. Yeah, I mean, it made me think about, you know, why would something like this come about in the first place? Is it really to kind of deter, uh, you know, development of apartments? Is it to specifically maybe prioritize a particular, you know, single family home ownership? Do you want to do you so elaborate? I think interesting, there, I think we did also copy an old article as part yes, of that. So if you write through that article, part of that argument at the time, and so all we have to go off, That's I, right. none of us were here in 1974 when they had this discussion. <laughs> um, uh, but the conversation actually at that point was interestingly also a cost of service argument. And they made the case the opposite way, which was uh, there's a lot of residents here, so they have more service requirements. And so they should pay at a higher rate for that reason. Now there was clearly then not that discussion about, well, how does that square with condos? But that was one of the rationales provided at least within the article as part of the discussion. Yeah, and I think that's actually quite important historical context to this whole conversation. I mean, this is why I, my first question was about intent of why we're doing this. Um, and I think for me, that equity piece is really important. Um, and I was hoping that we can have more of kind of the you know information on that particular piece. Um, but I think m more so we've heard a lot about the competitiveness. Um, so I was hoping that you could, you know, draw, if you have any other insights kind of on this particular element of this policy, I, I'm, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tang. I think at, at this point, um, when we're looking at the equity piece, what, what we're struggling with in assessment and taxation is the rationale for treating a similar property differently taxation-wise. Council absolutely has the purview to do it. There's a very broad, um, leniency within the legislation to allow council to subset subclass residential property. But what we don't see is a really strong reason for it to be subset in the fashion that it has been. It is, it, it seems, a historical 
because when we look at similar properties such as condominiums, we don't see a difference in the service or the mm -hmm. use, perhaps not even in, in the type of um, ownership, as uh, Mr. Zabo was saying. Um, the other piece is the servicing costs, where we have, through the city plan, discovered that servicing of this type of property is less expensive than non-dense property, such as single residential homes. If I just, I'll throw out very Please. quickly for, for the arguments, right? So the arguments in favor, in addition to, I think, the equity argument made about condos versus multifamily would be that multifamily, so this is the arguments in favor of the removal of the rate would be that they are multi, they are residential properties and they house residential property owners. They should pay at the same rate as other residential property owners. Multifamily owner or properties often house renters who are often the ones who are the most challenged to pay. And so there's a conversation about rent, to what extent you think that's important, that will actually trickle down is another conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's the argument that if we lower these costs, it results in more construction, higher density, that conversation that comes along with that. And that we also see that reflection of costs, that density is uh, cheaper for us to maintain as a municipality. On the flip of that, you could argue that pro multifamily properties are more akin to businesses, and so that they should be taxed at a higher rate. I think that's been a conversation that's been gone on here. Uh, and then there's a case that qu questioning the other arguments about to what extent does property tax affect the market and business decisions to either locate here, adjust rents. Perhaps the market is much greater than that. Supply demand factors are not going to be influenced significantly by this, and so it's a false argument. That would be the argument on the other side. And then uh, similarly for construction, that we don't think that they're going to necessarily result in more construction. So those are some of the arguments on either side of that debate, and really it's a question of where do you come down on all of those different arguments and how do you weigh them against each other? Yeah. Thank and if you. I can yeah, just one please. more thing, yeah, if you do want to go down the path of subclassing by density, mm -hmm. you will need to decide what to do with other, other residential because you can't do both. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you so much. That thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. You know, I don't know that I have too many further questions. I think administration has really laid out a lot of information very clearly for us. Um, did just want to speak to again. I thought I thought the phrasing around uh, can't speak yet. Oh no, I was I, I have question. No. Okay. Sorry, sorry. That was just <laughs> you already said you don't have questions, Many but so. questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, the incentive for downward pressure over time. So I think that that um, that was really well put, and I and just want to clarify my understanding as well that there's sort of. The incentive for downward pressure, just in terms of reducing the operating costs um, for for uh, a multifamily property manager, and then also increasing supply. So is that is that a fair assessment? That there's sort of two ways in which it creates that downward pressure over time. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Great. Yeah, and I think that systems uh, piece is really important. Also, really appreciated the commentary in the report that again, we are not able to advance our we, we, the taxation tools at our disposal to encourage city plan um, can't be brought to bear while other resen residential maintain, remains in place. I would characterize it as this. If, if, if council believes that the city plan is the direction for this city and one of the major thrusts of that is a densification of the city within the current footprint to, to not or to have a tax regime that actually runs counter to that feels counterintuitive. So as Deputy Pabri is saying, it, it is it is also that we, we can't pursue density based subclassing, but it's that's one piece. But the initial piece is that we have a tax regime that doesn't really support one of the major thrusts of city plan. Yeah, absolutely. And then just really wanting to uh, focus on that question of, you know, is it is it a is it a business or is it um, a resident a residence? And again, I just think it's so important to focus on the fact that it is not a matter of whether people are earning income off of these properties. It is just because there are multiple units on a title. And so someone can own an entire building of condoized units and pay a lower tax rate. Um, and be renting those those condos out. That is correct. It, it is a conflation of income tax policy and property tax policy. Yeah. In the municipal realm, we really only have property tax policy to deal with. Right. So, so again, we are not... 
we are not distinguishing this by, uh, by again, it's, it's not that they are revenue generating units, it's that they happen to all be on a single title, whereas you can have separately titled revenue generating units that pay a lower tax. That is correct, yes. Great. Okay, well, thank you. I will have uh, much to speak on uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have a referral to put on the floor, but it, it is obviously in context with this motion. It doesn't have to be withdrawn for this uh, referral. Um, and I'll just read it in. That uh, February 15th, 2023, Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01153, be referred back to administration for more comprehensive analysis on rental competitiveness with competitiveness with other major municipalities, including rental builds, rental unit availability, um, an overview of tax and service competitiveness with other major municipalities, including income tax options that offset corporate costs. Um, of course, I would be on the federal provincial level and a report back on all rules council can consider to enhance Edmonton's rental competitiveness, including potential offloading and incentive scenarios in terms of tax load distribution across all tax classes. And I don't have a due date for this um, so, and that can emerge but uh, to quickly introduce it. Just hold on. Second. For, we need a seconder. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Another Sorry. for a seconder. That also uh, will be helpful if we could get the uh, the wording on the screen as uh, uh, okay. as, yeah. as you as you introduce the item. Councillor Prickett, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, yeah, just to quickly introduce it, um, this referral comes out of uh, some of the questions that I've heard today. Um, and they're very excellent questions and things that we should answer. Um, I, I think that this is probably a good move, but we should also have the data to be able to back up this move. And uh, I also uh, think that um, uh, the reason for this referral uh, also lies in the fact that in discussing the subclass, um, it occurs to me that there are a whole lot of other questions around uh, what we might call equity of services uh, concerns and also city building uh, opportunities as far as city plan goes that this one item doesn't encapsulate and so if we uh, expand the conversation as we still work on this um, it can only lead to good things so that's the intro thank you councillor Paquette now questions on the referral right Questions on the referral, Council Silver. Questions on the referral. Uh, sure. Go ahead, please. <laughs> so, for the first part of this motion, for the for the first bullet, um, I'm just wondering, and to administration, I guess, how I'm struggling to see how administration would begin to evaluate rental competitiveness. Um, just given the multitude of factors that go into that, um, how how do you interpret that first piece? I think that would be part of the challenge of this. Just I'm just seeing this right now, rental competitive. Uh, we probably would do it by looking at what the average rent is across other major cities. But I guess, would you be able to establish causal factors associated with that? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm still reflecting on the initial motion that was put on the floor. And are you like, are you going to be able to establish that the other residential is, you know, reducing our competitiveness? Like, that's what I'm struggling with. Do you know, does that make sense? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, um, but we would look at how we compare across the country and include what tools council has if we want to enhance the competitiveness. And I'm assuming enhancing the competitiveness means enhancing the supply. I'm, I'm not sure. So I, I would just say, like, I think what we, there are some, easier things that we can do, like compare rents across markets, right. compare units across markets. The complexity of the analysis, and we'd have to do it in order to know it, is what does all of that tell us yeah. and what are the multitude of factors that come into play to get the explanation of why things are different in different cities. So I don't, I don't know that I can necessarily answer the question. Yeah. 
yeah, and then what tools do we have to actually influence those multitude of factors would be, I guess, a body work that follows. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think the, the other questions I had were from the initial uh, emotion, which to the chair, uh, to the chair, just to, to clarify, um, I can only ask questions on the referral now, correct? Yeah. Okay, then I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Just to speak. Okay, Councillor Tang on the referral. Um, yeah, I think just in terms of the due date, uh, would you would the mover consider kind of wrapping this up together with SOVA? Absolutely. No. If that gives the administration enough time. Not time, possible. Councillor Paquette, we're hearing from administration that kind of work is not Oh, possible. I thought you were asking me. Sorry. No, no. Sorry. Administration is not... Not, cannot do this work by SOBA. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I just wanted to interject that that is not a, we could not conduct this type of analysis okay. by right. the spring SOBA. Okay, no, fair enough. Um, and I also, it is, a, I get it, this is a tax conversation and SOBA is a budget conversation, but there's tax implications that that was kind of was hoping to do with the, with the timeline. So then kind of the standard is, the, like is that something? I think we'd need longer than the 13 weeks. I see. Okay. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nat, questions Just on to speak. Thank speak. You. Councillor Principe, questions on the referral? I have a process question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, what the, which motion will we be voting on? So, great question. So, there was a main motion put on the floor by Councillor Stevenson. And then a referral motion takes precedence over the main motion that's on the floor. So just for absolute clarity and what I was trying to explain before, and I might not have done a very good job, is the referral motion is to send the item away back to administration. However, there's also a motion on the floor that's going to go with it. Yeah. And then when the report comes back from administration and they can speak to the timelines, the recommendation report will come back from administration and there will already be a motion on the floor when this comes back for a future debate. But right now, technically, the referral motion is what takes precedence for voting purposes. So as the mayor already stated, you should be talking about the intention of the motion, which is to refer and then have actions completed, not the original main motion on the floor. Okay, and when it comes back, we would have the opportunity to vote on the main motion that was presented today? So the main motion on the floor will, will come back automatically on the floor. Um, so the report that will come back is a motion on the floor report, which is a bit a bit unique. Um, and then it will be up to council at that point in time to to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Stevenson to speak or questions. Just a, a few quick questions. Go I ahead, think please. E following from Councillor Salvador's questions. So recognizing that it'll be it'll be extremely complex to to show causality. I think my assumption, Ms. McCabe, if I'm correct, would be that we may see that there's a variety of factors that influence rental competitiveness, and property taxes may be one of those things. I guess would it just seems that if it is one of the fact okay, will it do you reckon that? property taxes will be one of the factors that influences rental competitiveness. I would think so, but I'm not sure without doing the analysis. And what I would say is that you have limited tools. This is what's before you today. One of the tools that you have, really the only other tool was probably grants. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that's, that's very true. And, and it sounds like, um, Ms. Padbury, given your comments, that this is quite an extensive body of work. I think it would take us some time to complete, but I also would just ask Ms. McCabe to confirm that because I think a, a, much of this would be done out of her department. Yeah, this is not going to be the standard turnaround, and I'm not sure that we'll even be able to fully answer it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, again, I, I usually really welcome having additional information, but I... It just sort of seems that, as you say, at the end of the day, we have a tool. It's one of the very few tools that we have in our toolbox. Um, and, and typically, if something is being taxed more, it is a disincentive for that thing to happen. That's a fair statement. 
and so I'm not sure what what information we could find that would that would refute that. Okay, I'll thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, uh, before I go to Councillor Wright, I want to welcome uh, students from uh, Grade Six class, Ben Calf Robe School. Uh, they are here with their uh, teacher, Miss uh, Paluski, uh, and. Uh, uh, their consul representative is Consul Salvador Ward Meti. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> nice to see you. I was uh, at your school long time ago when I was a federal minister of infrastructure. Uh, very was very proud to announce, I think, five million dollar for the schools and innovation. Uh, at that time, it was the first time that federal government actually funded uh, uh, a school. And uh, for renovation, very proud of that. Cool. All right. Nice to see you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, carrying on with the questions to refer on referral, Councillor Wright. I, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. McCabe. You'd mentioned that you'd be looking at sort of the average rental income at committee. Um, when I referenced the CMHC's um, stats for average rental incomes, it was quite a bit lower than what the, one of the speakers had quoted. And, and I'm just wondering, they were looking at the rental on newer properties. Would, does that difference really come into play on this or does it need to be looked at differently? I don't know. Um, I haven't done an analysis on the information that was provided by uh, the industry member at committee. Um, and I'm not, I was just suggesting that might be one way we would do the its analysis. We don't have this expertise in house to be able to look at rental competitiveness, this might be something that we need to get some help with. Um, uh, I'd have to spend some time scoping out exactly how to do this. Okay, all right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford on referral, questions to speak? Okay. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? Yeah. Happy to take the chair. Thank I you. have a couple of questions. Uh, I understand that it's, it's a, It'll be a significant amount of work, but I also understand that in the report, the survey or engagement that was done, many Edmontonians were opposed to this change, right? It, we had two focus groups um, held in the evenings with, with minimal attendance, but those individuals were not in favor for the reasons they, they didn't particularly like landlords. The industry people were yeah. perhaps unsurprisingly very much in favor. I might ask communications and engagement, Cecily, if you're available to speak to our engagement results. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Um, we had about 20 participants in our community engagement okay. sessions. Um, there was a bit of, of mixed feedback that we got. So a small majority, nine people who voted, um, weren't in favor of a phase out at all. They felt that it um, treated landlords preferentially and that they had access to things like income tax write-offs that ordinary citizens didn't have. However, on the other side of things, about four people um, did vote in favor of phasing out the other residential subclass because they felt that uh, a higher density of, um, of residents met lower cost to the city and they didn't really see the rationale for charging them higher. Okay, all right, so it wasn't a big sample, okay. Uh, the, I understand the argument on uh, rental condominiums and rental private homes, but am I correct in my assessment that, uh, or understanding that if, the, if shift happens uh, from this subclass and leveled, and the most of the burden will be shifted over to owner-occupied homeowners. If I could answer that one, yeah. um, it is uh, entirely up to council. There is also the ability to move that shift onto the non-residential. That is part of the uh, part of the. But under under the current plan, under what has been we contemplated so far we are not considering dividing that burden. We are considering shifting from subclass to, to other residential, uh, from other residential to residential. If I, if I read the motion that Councillor Stevenson um, put on the floor, it doesn't speak to where that shift goes. It could go to either 
uh, the rest of the residential class or it could go to the non-residential class. That would be a subsequent discussion. And just to note, we're not debating that I, motion yet. So, so I'm going to want to come back to uh, my question on disinformation. The reason I'm asking is that I want to have that information. Uh, I shared some data with the uh, administration on Calgary's rental numbers, right? And uh, wouldn't that information generated through referral help us understand better? Not to, maybe not as much clarity, right? So at least have better understanding. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not clear whether there's a benefit. So I just want to get, would this new information will provide that clarity? I think perhaps the biggest challenge that we have is it, 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 it's like trying to, uh, it feels like you want assurance on what this will do in the future and I'm not sure I can provide that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, So we don't know then, but you can't provide that in the future, so that lack of clarity exists now as well. And what we can say is that this change would have strong policy alignment to the city plan. That we know. Yeah. So, okay, I'll, I know it's, it's related to referrals again. I, Still really struggling with, okay, anyways, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, I'll uh, speak to it when time comes uh, and I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Okay, so everyone is to speak now. All right, we'll start with Councillor Hamilton to referral. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I thought I would be inclined to not agree with the main motion and I thought I would be inclined to agree with this referral, but um, we surprise ourselves sometimes. Um, uh, because I think a point that's been made is that people don't really like landlords and you don't really want to support REITs. So we can just take that argument off the table. Um, uh, uh, why I struggle with this referral motion is because it is um, about something that I think this conversation fundamentally shouldn't be about. It's about economic incentives and it's about affordability and it's about rentals. And what I think we have on our hands is fundamentally a question about tax policy and land use. And I think that all of those very important questions have taken us away from, uh, uh, I think one of the really interesting parts of this job, which is figuring out how we have allocated land use and then how we tax appropriately on it. Um, I think that Councillor Paquette is asking good questions, as I do think Councillor Rutherford, who tabled a referral motion earlier in this debate, is also asking good questions. How do we create more affordability um, for our, in our city? How, how does Edmonton stack up uh, against other municipalities in Alberta and across Canada? And what are the tools that we have at our disposal to improve that affordability um, for people who might not be able to, say, own their own home um, um, for a number of reasons? Uh, what are the incentives for, for bringing on more supply? I think those are, are very good questions, but I don't think it fundamentally pertains to the question in front of us, which is, is it fair that we have a different tax rate for, for resident, different types of residential? I don't think our city plan is agnostic on that question, um, uh, and I don't think uh, we, uh, should be allowing uh, that uh, that kind of difference uh, to exist under our current city plan. I could say more about what uh, where we are going um, with the main motion, but I think uh, by referring this, we're going to kick the debate six, eight, maybe a year down the road. If we defeat the motion on the floor today, it also kicks the question a year down the road. It's same, same, and I don't think we get. Uh, I think we can still um, debate the fundamental question of, of is our tax policy fair when it comes to residential and get the answers to this quest, these questions. But I think continuing to refer it down the road uh, will con lead to, I'll say, uh, a continued lack of clarity on where what council's position is on this question. Um, I think uh, pass or fail, it would be helpful to signal what our thoughts and intentions as a governing body are on the question of our, our current 
tax policy um, as it relates to other residential. And I think um, pass or fail, we can still procure this type of uh, a quest, uh, this type of information on on the economy, but uh, an economic incentives. But I think by conflating the two, we've made for a really tricky conversation, and I think we've created a conditions by which administration cannot answer to our satisfaction ever. Um, if our tax policy will accomplish what we want because we're not super clear on what we want on this. These are different questions. So I don't think we should, I'm, I'm gonna vote against referral. Um, I think we should vote on the main question, pass or fail. Uh, and I think that the the conversation around affordability, around rentals, I'm conscious of, of Councillor Jans's um, uh, sort of statement that 32% of Edmontonians are, are renters. I think those are questions, that's a conversation to be had, but I think it needs to come away from the notion of tax policy. Um, so I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Neck? I wish I had gone before Councillor Hamilton. I feel like she covered all the points. So I'll, I'll offer just a few uh, additional pieces. Uh, I, I would echo pretty much everything she said to me. This, this motion it's great information, has no relevance to the actual main motion. Uh, and and I, the reason I, I say it has no relevance um, is back to that notion of, of what we have before us is a, f is a question of fairness and a question of whether something is equitable. And so I think this information would be great in helping us determine if there's other types of economic incentives and all of that, um, but I, I don't see how that applies to answering the questions that we've been asked for, which is that is it fair to be charging a higher tax rate for higher density development? I, I think we already know the answer. The answer is no. It's, it's not equal right now, therefore that is the case. And in fact, not only is it not equal, I mean, it's not equitable. I mean, if we, if we were truly thinking about equity on this, higher density would be charged a lower tax rate in this city. Um, because as we now know, which I guess they didn't know in the 70s during that debate, it costs far less to maintain higher density development than it does uh, standalone single family homes. That question's not before us, that question's not been, is not being brought forward. Um, although I think one could argue that that would be relevant at some point, but, but nevertheless, um, at a minimum, we should at least make it equal. So I think going to get this information we're gonna be asked to, and again, we've heard, it's gonna be hard to fully you know, understand what that actual impact is. Um, and we're gonna be left with the exact same question, uh, which, which is already before us today. And so uh, I'm ready to vote. I, I think I don't need to speak to the other item. I'm ready to support uh, the initial motion of the phase out because uh, in this case, I think all the residential, with the exception, and I realize my own irony of, uh, I did support a uh, derelict uh, property tax difference, and part in part because from an equity perspective, those properties were taking up far more services than anything else, which is why I was willing to support that and why I would have been even willing to entertain a, a conversation about a density subclass. Um, and, and so I don't know if, if this was to, again, if this referral gets approved you know, or if it fails, and then we approve the next motion, that may or may not turn into tangible results to the folks that rent. Um, I, I would hope it would, because I do feel, I, I have a really tough time, and I, and I keep hammering home on the, the mobile home communities. I have a really tough time justifying to the residents in the mobile home communities in the city why they are paying essentially a residential rate on their building, and then a, they're paying their other residential rate for the people that own the land. And, uh, I've always had a trouble with that. I don't think it's equal. I don't think it's equitable. So uh, I'll vote against the referral and, and I'll save myself from speaking to the main motion and, and vote in favor of the main motion for the reasons already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I've got an important point of process that I just caught. Just hold on. Hold on. I need to go to a, a clerk to see if you have that process question or how you can ask that. Can I go to Councillor Paquette? He said, is it point of privilege or point of work? What a is point it? Point of process is, is a new one, yeah. but I, I don't it's, know what it is. Oh, sorry, I don't, I, okay, then I, it's a point of privilege, I suppose. I thought it was a point of process. My apologies. So what is your point? Uh, there is a small typo that I just picked up on in this motion. <laughs> it's a point, and, uh, it's a point so of order it, then. In the third bullet, it says, can consider 
to enhance Edmonton's rental competitiveness, including potential offloading in terms of scenarios in terms of tax or distribution across all classes. It was supposed to say Edmonton's tax competitiveness, including potential offloading, because that's the only way that sentence actually makes sense. And so that was a typo. And now we're voting on something that wasn't intended. And I, I'm assuming it's too late to do anything about that, but I should, I wanted to raise that point. I'll go to clerk for guidance. Can it be corrected? The, I the that motion that um, is up on the screen is the one that I was given. If that, if there is an error in it, it's completely legitimate to accept that change. A hundred percent my error. I didn't catch that. So can you read your last bullet again, Councillor Paquet, please? Just to change the rental in the last bullet from rental to tax. Tax competitors. Yep. Yeah. Is that uh, a nightmare, Sohi? Oh, go ahead. So uh, Edmonton's rental competitiveness, that changes to what? It would say tax competitiveness. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. got it. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I wouldn't have caught that if... Uh, it's okay anyway. now. It's okay, Councillor. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, where we were. Uh, next, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I think uh, both councillors Hamilton and Ned Knack have spoken to this very uh, well. I'm also usually inclined to, to seek more information and, uh, you know, really look at, at data. I think that the type of data that we're looking for will be really challenging to pin down in terms of some of that, that conclusive exact proof given the multitude of factors that, that play into uh, different, different housing markets across the country. Um, and I worry about the, the staff resources that are committed to it. Um, I feel comfortable with the information that's been presented to us today and, and what I've heard so clearly is that this is uh, an important structural change that helps us achieve city plan. Uh, we've spent a lot of time around this table talking about city plan and our desire to see that implemented. Um, and delaying this conversation, I think, um, signals that that, that commitment uh, um, there is a missed opportunity to demonstrate that that commitment to achieving those outcomes. I think the the shift over time, the incentive for downward pressure on the cost of housing is is truly important. Again, not only reducing the operating expenses, having op operated housing as a housing provider um, in a nonprofit scenario, which still paid property taxes on some properties, I can certainly speak to the very thin margins that exist to providing people with decent and adequate housing. Um, I think that not only does it address affordability in that immediate context in that way, but also by increasing the supply of rental housing in the long term. Uh, I think this is a, a, a really critical opportunity uh, to achieve our city building goals. So I, I don't wish to delay the decision um, and, and we'll be voting against the referral. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'll be brief because I will just speak specifically to the referral at this point. Um, I do want to counter one of Councillor Knack's comments about, you know, the relevance of the competitiveness comment because I was at, I sat at executive with you and every public speaker, that was their argument for why we should do this. So I don't think we can, we should discredit that as something that industry is saying that that's, that's a driver for them. You know, I, I love the hope and the optimism that this would lead to, you know, lower rental, but you know, the research shows that trickle down economics is not a thing. It's really not a thing that does exist. And so taking the money out of people's pockets and taking it out of the Edmonton economy is gonna have the opposite effect of what we're trying to have. I, I, I will have more to say if this fails and the other, the other motion is on the floor. But uh, I, I, while I agree with many, I'm not sure this information will change the dynamic of the conversation because I think this is really a question of values, fairness, timing, as opposed to can we actually get data that shows that this has a cause and effect. I don't think we will, that is elusive data, I completely agree. And 
that is what the public speakers came and said, that, that we are not competitive rentally as a city, and so that to me is a bigger conversation we need to have. And I still need to be able to go back to Edmontonians and at some point say, we've done our due diligence and looked at all the data points. So the fact that we have administration saying, I don't know on some things as we're here making a decision today makes it very uncomfortable for me to be able to go back whatever way the decision goes and stand behind that decision. So I'm willing to explore this further because I think we owe it to Edmontonians to do that due diligence. And I think that good information will come from this. Will it be related to tax subclassing? I don't think so. But will it be related to how we look at spurring rentals and making Edmonton really competitive in the rental space? I think that could. So I think good can come out of this subsequent, or sorry, this referral motion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I will attempt to just, just speak once to this. Um, and for me, this conversation is very much rooted in fairness and equity when it comes to our approach to taxation. And this conversation is also about creating the structural changes that are, that are necessary to achieve the city plan. And I'm constantly reflecting on how limited we are when it comes to the set of tools available to us to implement the city plan. And it's really important that we are doing everything we can to ensure that not only things like zoning and our regulatory context and our land use um, are in alignment with that, but it's important that our taxation policies are also supportive of that direction that we're collectively going in, um, not contradictory to it. And I, and I do see the, the current approach to other residential as contradictory to city plan. Um, and I think it's also important to mention, you know, if we are steadfast in our commitment to achieving the city plan, it will actually save Edmontonians money and overall, uh, overall and reduce our tax burden over time as we become more efficient with our infrastructure utilization and our servicing and as we grow our tax base. Um, I again constantly reflect on the city plan uh, citation that we'll see an 8% overall cost reduction, a 5% residential tax reduction if we stick to it. And when I listen to the rationale for why the other residential category was initially put in place, I think that um, our thinking has evolved since then. And we now know that efficient development patterns and land use patterns are directly related to, um, to the way that we're growing. So we've been trying to off ramp this for decades. I think that that's a, a pretty clear indicator that, that it does need to be phased out. And as it relates to affordability, I am not under the illusion that this will create direct and immediate reductions in rental rates. I don't think it will. But in the medium and long term, increasing the overall supply of rental housing does have affordability benefits citywide. Like this is a, a widely accept, accepted economic principle. And again, it's, it's a structural change that is going to take years to see the, the effects from. Um, but I, I do think that we need to, to continue off-ramping, as has been in the works for decades. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, and I, I do appreciate the information that's being asked for here. I think that the referral motion, um, you know, it, it's good and it's, there's some valuable piece of information that could come from that, but I don't necessarily, necessarily see why that should be attached to, to something that we know could be done and started today uh, that, that could have an effect. So I'll end it there, uh, but appreciate the discussion today. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Prince Bay. Um, I'm okay, Mr. Mayor. I don't have anything to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if any of the information that's being requested um, in this motion would make me change my mind. Um, or, or help support it uh, with constituents. You know, knowing that it was, it was kind of an arbitrary um, subclass, I guess, in the, in the first place, I do think it does show, by, by removing it and doing it in a gradual way, I think does show um, equity amongst the residential property holders. And um, so I will be voting against um, this motion for for administration to do more work, they've got enough to do, and um, we'll be supporting um, uh, Councillor Stevenson's motion. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor 
Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? Yeah. I have the yeah. chair. You know, I I want to support the shift from subclass and merging that into a, into overall taxation because uh, I when I compare that to uh, that inequity, I understand that part when you when I compare that to condominiums and other rentals, right? But I am unable to support that shift because I don't have the necessary information in front of me to really understand some of the objectives that administration and some of the folks in the development community have identified. First, on the affordability, it's clear from listening to the conversation that reducing this tax differential for landlords would not transfer to a lower, lower rental cost for renters. That is, in the immediate, would not happen. Long term, it's a guess game. Will it happen or not? Uh, it is a major shift in my mind. We just went through a budget process. We passed a tax levy of 4.97% tax increase. And uh, shifting this burden, which will, which will primarily fall on the uh, uh, on single occupancy, owner occupied dwellings. Uh, you know, you can, we can talk how much burden that is, but accumulated is about 2% or in, in, in that range, right? So it's not insignificant. Uh, it is not, it's like, it's 0.5% if you spread over five years, I understand, right? So uh, of every year, so it's, uh, it's not insignificant. Uh, uh, burden that you're shifting, right? So uh, I I wish we had done that during the budget discussion, then we would have been more transparent uh, with Adventonian, so that's a concern for me. But the bigger concern is that I have not seen the data that will s demonstrate that it is a market disadvantage. I look at 2019 figures compared to Calgary 2020 figures, 2021, 2022 figures, Edmonton built more rental, purpose-built rental, regardless of this differential. So I worry that uh, we are just transferring uh, $13 million uh, from uh, homeowners over to landlords without seeing any benefit to the renters or seeing any benefit that it will spur more rental supply without having that information. So if this information, this referral is approved and this information becomes available that help me change my mind, I would like to support that shift. But at this time, I cannot support that shift, right? So I will support the referral. If referral fa fails, I would not be able to support uh, 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 the shifting of the burden uh, onto, uh, onto homeowners uh, at a time when we approved the tax levy, which was significant. Uh, we also are living through high inflation that is causing pressure on, uh, on, on, on household spending. And I approved that tax levy with understanding that it will remain at 4.97% or maybe lower in the future, uh, but I cannot add to that. Maybe it's easier for those who did not vote the budget, budget, did not support the budget to justify that. For me, it's not. It's not, for me, it's very difficult to add more burden onto, uh, onto property owners uh, at, uh, at, at, the, at this time or shifting of this burden. Uh, so it's a principle that I have to abide by uh, in my mind. Uh, I will take the chair back. And I'll go to Councilor Tang next. If we're only speaking once to this, I'll, I'll just do it now, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think there's lots of great points made already in terms of, you know, achieving our growth targets and achieving, um, you know, various policy objectives. I think this whole conversation actually reminds me so much of a lot of the discussions around Zoning bylaw, um, we know policies discriminate uh, often. And you know, this kind of was, I think the historical context really surprised me. Um, and I think in general, I, I would like to, us to phase out policies that have discriminatory roots. 
um, you know, so I think things certainly have evolved. Um, I'm not sure. I, of course, I think evidence and research is always good. I'm just not sure that we're going to be getting the answer that uh, we're really seeking to, to, to finally come to a decision that we're all going to be really happy with. Um, and I'm mindful of the amount of work uh, that is going on on top of that, the OP12 work. Um, so I, I question if we're just kind of giving ourselves more work that may not necessarily get to the outcome that we, we think we want. Um, I've been really, I think, yeah, I've been really struggling with this. Um, and I think uh, in the end, the, you know, I think this tension between fairness and equity versus incentive. And for me, I think the former uh, argument outweighs, at least um, for me, uh, outweighs all others. Uh, I, I think we need to make sure our policies um, are no longer um, inequitable or in some ways discriminatory. I know that it's not gonna yield the immediate result that people would like to see, but supply takes time to build. I, I, I get that. Um, and I think longer term we can, as my colleagues are already highlighted. Uh, in terms of, um, so I will not be supporting the referral, but I will be supporting the main motion. Uh, one thing I will just add here, you know, I think that shift does not have to be drastic and we don't have to unfairly um, burden um, taxpayers. Um, you know, I certainly would like to see the phase out over a longer period than what is proposed. Um, I also would like to see this in the context of perhaps other um, budget adjustment as they will ha also have tax implications and be considered as a package rather than a standalone um, policy discussion, which I also think has a potential to politicize and further polarize uh, the debate. Um, so I think those are just kind of the the thoughts that, that's been kind of flowing through my head. We've done a lot of work on the zoning piece um, and the equity component uh, embedded in that. I think this is kind of another um, that may be less, less, less talked about in the public sphere um, because we don't really know that, we, people didn't really know the history behind that. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dan. Councillor Paquette to close. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, everyone. And just remember, just because you stated a position doesn't mean you have to stick with it when it comes to the vote. So maybe I can help change your mind a little bit here. So this motion is actually very germane to the motion on the floor. And uh, the reason why is, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about is, uh, you know, this idea of equity and tax fairness. Well, that's in this referral. And rather than piecemealing that conversation, we should be having a larger conversation. You know, Councillor Nack raised uh, mobile home communities, uh, which really should be part of this conversation. If we're talking about equity of services, do all areas of Edmonton actually get equity of services? Should we be piecemealing the conversation? Absolutely not. Um, the other, the other uh, point that the mayor raised so ably is that we're talking about a $13 million plus redistribution onto the residential class, essentially raising taxes for everyone else because we were so eager to change this right now without, without the pertinent information uh, that we can't actually justify it except for with generalities or with um, opinions. We don't have the facts and the data to back up the decision. Now, as Councillor Rutherford mentioned, in executive committee, almost all the arguments were about competitiveness. It wasn't about land use, and you know, and, and so it's a it's a it's a roundabout sort of idea. Residents have been used to uh, this system. We passed a four-year budget. We're now saying in in the spirit of fairness, without the ability to actually tell you why, except that we think it's more fair because an, uh, a decision back in the, in the 70s was arbitrary, you're not gonna be paying more taxes. Oh, will this affect people who, who live in those buildings? Probably not. Will it, will it incent rental uh, bills? We don't know. That's not the kind of rationale I wanna hang my hat on and go back to my residence uh, in order to justify. I want this information. And 
this doesn't make work for uh, administration because there are a lot of questions that are going to come up as we uh, evolve the city plan and move into the city plan that these specific questions will actually help answer because this is not the only place that we look at as far as is the tax system here fair for this subclass or this section or these people. So there is actually a body of work that needs to be done to inform those conversations. This is that body. Now, when we are talking about land use, sure, but this is a tax policy discussion that also folds in land use. And so that is one part of the conversation, but it's not the entire part of the conversation. We have to be able to show our work. And right now we can't. The, the very justifications that people gave us for why this was needed cannot be answered. And it's on record. We can pull the video. And so let's answer these questions. And here's the beautiful thing. It actually does nothing with the timeline uh, proposed in, in the main motion. In the main motion, I, I, I believe, uh, you know, it's pushed back to 2024. If this worked, yeah, let's, let's put it this way. We should put a deadline on this work so it doesn't uh, go beyond what, uh, you know, the end of 2024. I'd be surprised if it takes almost two years to do this work. And so there's actually zero risk here for the main motion whatsoever. But what there is, is the potential to make a decision based on greater information that will also subsequently inform all of our other decisions that we have to make in the city plan in, in this type of realm. But it will also allow us to perhaps even bring more people on board to this decision who may be alienated or upset by it or just simply not support the main motion. So let's be clear, this referral seeks to answer all of the questions and justifications raised for the main motion. Absent of those justifications and evidence, I am personally not looking forward to going back to my residence and saying, I don't know. It was an, it was a, it was an old arbitrary uh, decision back in the 70s, but we have to make it really rushed right now without the backing evidence. That just doesn't hold water. You know, and back to the mobile home communities. I've got a community uh, called Evergreen. They've got one bus uh, stop right at the end. Sorry, Councilor Paquette. Time is coming to that. Oh, I, time's up. Okay. Yeah. I'll Thank leave it at that. But you know what? Uh, please change your mind and support me. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. So please vote. On the referral? Yeah. I'm a yes. Councillor Cartmel? We've got Councillor Cartmel. Sorry, no. we've, we've got your vote. Thank you so much. We're just waiting for two more votes. I'm no. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Just waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, referral has failed. Now we go back to the original motion from Councillor Stevenson. May I ask an amendment? Councillor, can you sign oh. up, please, Councillor uh, Jens? Councillor Rutherford? Just to speak to it. To speak. Any? Okay, Councillor Jens, go ahead, please. Would the mover be friendly to um, changing the three years to a longer duration, such as 10 years? Councillor Stevenson? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a decision of the assembly. But 
yes, I'm seeing maybe five. <laughs> You okay with five? I'm sorry, I can't see. Five years? I, I'm sorry, I can't see the assembly spaces, but I'll just put that out there. Maybe if if the mover is friendly to it and folks she, around the room agree with the longer I think, duration, I think she's maybe friendly. somebody else can see that. I think she's more friendly to five than 10, right? So I think assembly is more friendly to five than 10. Then I'll leave it there if somebody wants to do that. Okay, you want to keep it to 10, but if somebody wants to move five. So before uh, we take amendments to the amendments, can we just get the amendment on the floor with a seconder, please, for clarity? There's no amendment yet. I mean, there's Councillor Stevenson's and Rutherford's. Uh, you know, sorry, which one are you talking about? If Councillor Jans wants to make an amendment, it's probably best we get clarity on that rather than sort of. He said he's not making he's it. He's not making it. No, that? he's not okay. making it. Yeah, yeah. no. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Tang? Uh, I was Yeah, the, oh. the, the motion, the original Councillor Stevenson's motion was not seconded by Councillor Rutherford. I, I can't remember, oh, I, who second? Yeah. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton. we'll Hamilton. fix that, thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to propose the friendly amendment to five years. Okay. I think that's... So that will naughty. end. So that's friendly, yeah, five years, no, Councillor... Okay, Councilor Rice is not agree to that, right? So we have uh, you who need a seconder. Second. Second by Councilor uh, Salvador to change from three to five years. Any questions on the amendment, right? Any questions on the amendment? Anyone to speak to the amendment? Okay, please vote on the amendment. Just to give us a second, we'll just put the amendment up on the floor. Thanks so much. Yes, Kim. Thank you, Councillor Kurtmo. Just waiting for one more vote. I'm um, no. Thank you. We have all the votes. Mr. Display the votes, please. <laughs> you want to recall the vote? Okay. No, we can recall the vote. No, it's okay. Sorry. Would you like us to recall the vote? Yes, please. Absolutely. Recall the vote. We'll send it back out. Yeah. That's fine. Here we go, please vote now. Changing to five years. Councillor Cartmel, we've just recalled the vote. Councillor Cartmel, are you able to vote on the amendment to change the three to a five? We're going to mark Councillor Cartmel as ad. No, he. I oh, think he's, he's trying to. Yeah. Councillor Cartmel, can you hear us? Yeah, he's he's trying to he's trying to join. If we can just give him a second. Uh, I if I can't hear it, I can't record it. Yeah, can you try again, Councillor Cartmel? Councillor Kurtmel. I can't hear his his vote and I don't know that he's an e-scribe, although it looks like he is. Can we just declare Councillor Kurtmel absent for the amendment? Okay. Thank you. 
Please display the votes. That is carried. Okay, just waiting the motion to, uh, Here we go. Questions? Councillor uh, uh, Stevenson, okay, second has been corrected. Councillor Nat, can you take the chair? I just have a couple of questions. Absolutely, I've yeah. got the chair. All right, so uh, the, the shifting of the, uh, the burden, right? Uh, how do we make, what, at what point do we make sure that is distributed among all classes, not just the uh, residential class. Uh, Mr. May, you could do that any time up to the setting of the tax bylaw. We would request as much time as possible so that we can make sure our calculations are correct. Okay, does this motion as presented leaves their flexibility open to, uh, to be adjusting at that time or is it or does it give you direction to shift from sub, uh, others residential to residential? Right only, now, only. as I read this motion, it says uh, just aligning other res and res. So those are the only two that are mentioned here. If there's a desire from council to include non-residential as part of the redistribution, I think that would have to be built in or we need that, that direction subsequently. There'll be a subsequent to this or as part of our amendment? Either this would have to be amended to indicate we want to also consider non-residential or we need that, we would need that direction subsequently. Okay. Uh, can I make an amendment to, uh, to this to be in, the wording would be to include non-res as well, right? What would the, wording be? I, I mean, I guess it's also a question of how much you want to distribute of that amount oh. to res versus non-res. There's additional complications there. Right. Okay, so Hardy, I would like to have that, but I know I can't craft a more amendment on the, on the fly, right? It's you could hard. say to evenly distribute the okay. differential. If that's, if that's if it's a 50 50 is what you're seeking, I'm not sure what the desire of council though is at this time. Yeah, like I don't know whether it's 50, 50, 30, 37, that I don't know, right? But I just want to make sure that it's distributed. In under a, the, in, in under the current motion, yeah. we would just simply be doing it immediately and it, you're coming, we're just coming with a bylaw with the change. So we would need to have an intermediary step to discuss different splits. But the, right now under this motion, there is no other report that's coming forward. We would just simply be coming forward at this point with just the change to the bylaw. So, so the change would be from eliminate other residential and shift all that burden over to uh, over to homeowners, uh, single occupied, not so, uh, owner occupied. Under the current motion, yes. So because this is 2024, yeah. though, we could take direction to look at that subsequent to this. Okay. Okay, but at this time we're voting on shifting to residential so, on, under this motion. So just to build on what Anton was saying, the motion on the floor is to direct administration to create the bylaw or to prepare the bylaws for 2024 with this direction. Yeah. So there is no report back. If there's additional work yeah. that you want to have happen, perhaps council could deal with this question. And then if there happens to be subsequent to this, yeah. happy to take. So I just want to, again, want to make sure that we're voting with full knowledge that the bylaw would come back shifting from other residential 
onto residential, right? At the, at the present moment, it just goes to residential, and we can take a motion subsequently to bring a report forward to do look at other options as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Okay. All right, now to speak to this. All right, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. I truly appreciated the conversations that were had at executive as well as today on this, and I'm glad that we have had thorough discussions on this because I think it is a really important topic. I understand the arguments for and against, you know, the phase out of the subclass as well as keeping it. Um, as with many decisions, there's positives and negatives, no matter the decision, and those are both intended and unintended consequences. You know, I think about earlier this month at audit committee, we heard from administration on corporate risk including flagging the unintended consequences of changing the planning development and funding strategies and shifting tax burden and pressures in the tax base. That was literally out of our audit committee meeting. I get the disparity. A rent, rental provider can get rental income on a standalone condo without the same tax implication. I would welcome rectifying that in the future. But I keep going back to this time and time the recent risk report, again, that was presented to audit committee highlighted that the highest risk in the short term is the cost of living crisis. The other residential class discussion has brought up conversation on council tax policy that were very interesting and compelling, especially around equity and fairness perspective. A compelling argument I heard was that the current system isn't equitable. But why are the current taxpayers the ones responsible for righting that wrong in totality when they are really hurting right now? I think if economic times were different, this would be a different conversation. I also have a really hard time seeing this tool as a be all and end all to spur rental to growth, which was an argument that industry brought forward at executive. I'm very reluctant to link this policy change to a change in the market. And there is also clearly no commitment that this, would, that this cost would be seen by renters. And in fact, when a phase out was done previously, that cost did not go, there was no downward pressure, short, medium, or long term that was able to be linked with that policy change. I also heard a lot of arguments about the advancement of the city plan goals and the need to not tax high density more than low density. And that for tax, there's very few levers in their systems that can support the city plan. City plan does mention densification and a tax regime that runs counter to that is challenging. These are all true facts. But I have to ask myself again, are we steadfast at to the, towards the city plan at what cost? And I would say the cost is not bringing people along with us on that journey. I campaigned on moving forward together and this to me is an example of how we are moving forward with not everybody behind us and not together. There's a time and a place and I worry that this time and this place right now is not that space. I'm glad to see that there was amended to give a longer runway that is why I supported the, the amendment from three to five years. I'm glad to see that it's not starting until 2024, though I think that the, the cost of living crisis, you know, is, was forecasted for the near future being the next two to three years. So I would have preferred to see this been a conversation in the context of the next four year budget. I get same to what Councillor Tang said, budget uh, and taxes are different conversations. But at the end of the day, I know that I was steadfast in my mind about a levy amount that I was comfortable with. And so worked hard to make sure that even though I knew it was gonna be high, it didn't go above that. And so now these subsequent decisions are inching that along. And lastly, I wanna say in my last minute, this conversation about, well, it doesn't have to all shift to residential. I, I absolutely agree with that. But again, the unintended consequences of shifting this. I heard from so many local, small, and mid-sized businesses, and again, that same risk report highlighted that small and mid-sized local businesses are at super risk right now. 
And so shifting that from residential to non-residential has implications too. And we've had so many conversations, we have so many things within this great agenda today that talk about how we're making policy and investments for economic development. We have to think about that in this context because that shift will have unintended consequences. So please do consider that in your vote today. And thank you for indulging me to speak not once to the, to the referral, but also to the, the main motion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, and, and I know I'm speaking twice on this, um, and, and I hope to make different points. As I mentioned earlier, I came into this debate um, expecting not to support it, um, uh, in part because it, it is a clumsy tool, I think, for what amounts to a corporate tax. Um, uh, and, and even though I think if you have a pension, you are the un maybe unaware, but you're the beneficiary of a real estate investment trust, um, they're generally not the heroes in this story. Um, but I will, uh, I'll go back to, I think, the point that I made um, uh, uh, and expand on it a little bit, that um, there has been an economic incentive argument made by industry, and there has been a, um, a argument made about it being, um, uh, that corporate tax, and I think both arguments are really imperfect arguments, um, and I think they take us away from uh, what this uh, this is fundamentally about. Um, as Ms. McCabe said, this is a values-based policy conversation, and what kind of outcomes are we trying to get for our city uh, in terms of built form, um, and in terms of, as Councillor Knack mentioned, uh, fairness and equitability um, and equity across the tax base. Um, I hear uh, what is being said about what this means for uh, uh, single dwelling residential homeowners. Um, and, uh, and I acknowledge that, um, and I think there is a pretty substantial runway to figure that, that particular question out. Um, but looking back at this marvelous article from 1974, um, when this was debated. Um, by the way, they all had also moved their council meetings from Mondays to Tuesdays in 1974, and this is a, a notable change. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that was brought up at the time was that, in fact, it was a discriminatory policy. Comments were made like homeowners, and they were referring to single family, like single detached dwelling, what we call a single family home, a homeowner, have more costs so, so they deserved essentially to pay less in taxes um, and that uh, renters had the ability to afford uh, an increase in, in what would be the trickle down impact of, of landlords putting the taxes on, um, uh, on the renters. Uh, I would agree with Councillor Rutherford, trickle down economics doesn't work, but we do know supply and demand does. And if you look at the amount of rental supply in the Edmonton market, there's this marvelous chart that was circulated at some point in the 2018, 2019 budget conversations. The amount of rental supply we have in the Edmonton market in the 1970s did not return to that level because of condominiumization until 2018, 2019. So in that period of time, the amount of uh, market rental available went down substantially. Was it because of our tax policies? I don't know. Was it because of federal incentives to build rental housing went away in the 1980s? I also don't know. What I do know is that the population of Edmonton has grown substantially in that time, and yet the net supply of rental is at the same levels it was in the 1970s. So something we have done in the past has not worked. Um, in the meantime, our expenses in operating the city uh, have gone up. The footprint of Edmonton has expanded quite significantly. And the most important part of this is that the city that we are trying to build, up not out, is, is the vision for the city for the next 20 to 30 years. And so this is, I think, about uh, changing a tax policy to not only um, reflect uh, what, what may or may not be the case in other markets, but most importantly, to reflect what we want to happen in our market and what our values are. To a certain extent, it doesn't matter what they're doing in Calgary or Vancouver or Winnipeg. It matters what we want to happen here and the kind of city we want to build. 
Um, and that's what I heard so much in this conversation is that people want to build um, Edmonton uh, and they want it to be built, I think, in the image of our values, which is equitability and affordability uh, uh, and livability. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquet. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. My colleague said it when it comes to what the impact of this will be. I don't know. <laughs> that's, so that says it all. Uh, I, I actually support this motion. I support this move. I just can't vote for it because I'd be voting essentially blind. And uh, that's, that's uh, you know, I just can't do that. Um, and this conversation about uh, moving the tax burden, not just to uh, other residential, but uh, to commercial, um, in a time when we are actually actively starting conversations about how do we change the uh, the burden on non-residential. So it's a, to say that uh, it's a bit of a puzzler as far as uh, the way that things are rolling out out of uh, a larger and more cohesive conversation, uh, I think is fair. Um, so I won't, I won't be supporting this motion today for those reasons, even though I actually really 100% support the concept. But I, again, I cannot go back to my residents and tell them, yeah, your taxes are going up. Uh, and I cannot tell you what the impact will be. <laughs> that's, that's something I can't do. But what I can do is uh, I heard that there was a lot of support for my referral, just not tied to this motion. So uh, I will be making a subsequent. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquet. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tolhi. Today is uh, actually a wonderful uh, discussion. And I heard so many, so many good points. Uh, I would like to uh, add one uh, on the top of my colleagues' great comments, great points. Um, tax policy. Yeah, tax policy, taxation policy is not only our council's business. I believe is the business of all Edmontonians. I would like this, add this point on the comments already there. And specifically, if you look at our tax revenue and then this tax, our city's revenue and heavily over 58% rely on our tax revenue. If you look at that pie and for our revenue, and who contributes to the tax? I believe business, non-residential, and also residential. And to get them on this journey and to make our tax policy change, I think that is an important step and we need to have and before we make any changes. Um, I actually, I learned lots today and from my colleagues' point, but I really think this is so important to get our public's voice on this policy change, not only this taxation policy and also other policy change as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Jans. Um, thank you. I just want to say I won't be supporting this motion, but it's been really interesting today that it's highlighted, like the mansion tax conversation, how challenging it is for municipalities to try and figure out how to get the money to keep the toilets flushing and the lights on and the police funded and the fire department doing their job. And, uh, you know, here we are spending a whole day, a second time, trying to figure out a tax policy to build our city in a way that's more fair and more just. And I can't help but juxtapose this with the news stories right now that the provincial government is giving away $20 billion to orphan well owners. Now, I'm not here to litigate that decision, but I want to talk about how, you know, when we think about in our province, we're the second largest city, and we're trying right now to attract investment, to build homes, to take care of people, to do 
all of these pieces. And we are so strapped with the tools available that here we are talking about subclassing that'll have such a minor impact one way or another, whether this motion passes or not on the timeline compared to the magnitude of these other issues going on. And it's just so frustrating to be a city councilor right now. Somebody told me, you know, the difference between an optimist and a cynic is four years experience. And I feel like, well, I'm 16 months in and here we are. So I also am worried, I guess two things. Um, we tend to keep talking about housing and markets and all this, like it's econ 101 and supply and demand, ceteris barabbas and all that. Um, but really we're in such a commodified housing market you know, 36% of people rent. A recent study came out that in Toronto, 42% of housing are investment properties. And, you know, it's, if we're serious about addressing the issue of housing, uh, affordable housing and renters' rights, we need to, as council, take a position. And I'm not sure that we have on pieces like landlord licensing, rent control. Like we, if we're serious about rent control, if we're serious about actually investing in public housing, those are the topics we need to be talking about. But because we're not having those conversations, it's sort of bleeding into this conversation, just like because we can't deal with solving housing. we This housing conversation keeps coming up in transit and everything else. So I'm, I'm agnostic. Like, I'm, I'm going to vote against this. I think it's I think the um, the five years is still shorter than I'd like. Um, but I don't think either the people for or against this, this is a, a, a rock in the ocean compared to the tide of the moon on the housing market. And the, the moon in this metaphor is supposed to be the legislature. I don't know if that's coming together, but thank you for listening to me croak on. <laughs> I am opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Uh, Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree that there does need to be some change. I think we do possibly need to consider changing the uh, other residential um, subclass, but I don't think that this is the right process. Uh, I think that market determines rent, period. It is a matter of supply and demand. It is not a matter of the tax rate. And I want to say that I've heard you know, landlords are not bad people. They supply a need. And uh, we, I've heard many people mention about equity. And a lot of people consider that um, uh, maybe it's not equitable that owners of rental apartments can um, deduct building operating costs from their income tax where homeowners can't. So there's, there are arguments on both sides. I do think that we need to see some change, maybe an update to the policy, but I'm just not confident that this is the correct way to go about it. Thank you, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Knapp, can you take the chair, please? Because I did need to correct some information that I was not able to properly articulate in my last spoke. You can. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. When I spoke uh, last on the other item, I think the numbers I stated on the tax levy were not accurate. I just want to state them again that uh, uh, the, the shifting of the burden from uh, the other residential class over to residential class will lead to uh, uh, spread over five years would lead to 0.3% uh, increase on uh, on property taxes for that residential class uh, starting in 2024 uh, if we were to do it uh, the overall shift in the in the burden is uh, from general residential subclass to residential class is 1.6 percent uh, uh, yeah so I think I just want to correct those numbers for for the for the record and uh, I will not be supporting this uh, the reason I stated earlier uh, this is not going to achieve the results that uh, public and administration wanted us to achieve and what we heard from the public uh, during the, the uh, during the executive committee. Okay. And I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. And I'll go to Councillor Stevenson to close. 
Yes, thank you so much. I think there have been uh, great comments from all of my colleagues. Um, you know, I'll just just close uh, by noting, you know, really appreciate the the affordability crisis, and I think I think the approach we've taken um, is is very prudent. So really, you know, working that out in an absolute number, uh, someone who owns a, a five hundred thousand dollar property would see an increase in of ten dollars in a year, so so less than a dollar a month, and again. Not, not that any addition is, is inconsequential, but when I think about the huge value that there is in what we're trying to do and, and the amount of effort that the rest of the tax base represents in terms of working towards our city plan goal, I think that, again, the value is, is truly there. Um, we're asking Edmontonians to make a lot of changes as we shift to a more sustainable city, uh, an energy efficient city, um, and a financially sustainable city. And I think what Edmontonians ask of us is that we, we are consistent and that we show consistency in our policies and decision. Uh, more than anything, this, this motion in front of us will uh, provide that alignment and, and reduce uh, a conflict that I, I think exists right now. And um, I think of a phrase that's, that always comes back to me is that the, the gap between words and action is where doubt grows. Um, so the more aligned we can be, the less space for doubt um, that Edmontonians can have in the vision that we've laid out as a community and, and the reason we're taking those decisions towards that goal. So I will leave it there and encourage you all to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. We're just waiting for one more vote. No. Councillor Kurt Mel, can I just confirm if you're with us? Uh. Just, no, he's in. He's it, he's in the scribe, but it shows he's absent. MJ. There we go. We're just going to send you back your vote privately, Councillor Kurt Mel. If you can vote, please. Councillor Kurt Mell, are you able to vote? I need to, there we go. We have all the votes. Okay, display it's the votes. coming. <laughs> yeah, we've got it. Thank you. Okay, display the votes, please. That is carried seven to six. Okay, now we are getting on with the... Oh, so he, just before we get to subsequent, just a friendly reminder that there was a recommendation attached to the private attachment in this report. If we could please deal with that before we get to subsequent, please. Sure, I can move that. Um, attachment 3 of the February 15th, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01153, remain private pursuant to Sections 24, Advice from Officials, and 27, Privileged Information of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Okay. Need a seconder? Second. Councilor Nack seconded that. Please vote. We're just waiting for two more votes. Councillor Rutherford? I voted. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Kurt Mell? <coughs> we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now to subsequent. Can you please sign up if you have a subsequent?
Councillor Paquette, I understand you have a subsequent motion. I hey, do. It's hey, just on my go ahead, please. My, yeah. Okay. And this will sound very funny. Uh, that administration prepare a comprehensive analysis and return report on rental competitiveness, competitiveness with other major municipalities, including builds, rental unit availability, an overview of tax and service competitiveness with other major municipalities, including tax options that offset corporate costs, and a report back to the tools council can to enhance Edmonton's tax competitiveness, including potential offloading and two scenarios in terms of tax load distribution across all tax classes. And uh, I don't have a due date for uh, where that would land. Uh, I'm not sure if that would land uh, exact or an urban plan. Need a seconder, please. Seconder. Second. Councillor uh, Principe seconded that. So procedurally, this is basically subsequent uh, wording is the same as the one, the referral that was defeated, right? And procedurally, yeah. procedurally is fine, right? I just ask the clerk. Yeah, so, so technically the motion that was made before was a referral motion yeah. with actions similar but not exactly the same as the subsequent motion that's been put on the floor. So it's up to the chair, yourself, to decide if this is in order or not. No. Yeah. Great. It's, I don't, I don't say yes for that. I said, I was thinking aloud, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's like, it's, it's the same thing. Like, it, this failed earlier on, Councillor Paquette, right? So, yeah, uh, and I'll give you a rationale. Um, and that is that I heard a lot of support for the idea of the motion. Uh, people would have supported it, but not tied to the main motion that was on the floor. And uh, councillors have all mentioned how it's important for us to understand uh, what we're doing with our uh, approach and policies uh, to rental and also to our uh, tax regime as far as how we uh, incent or make fair. You know, I am going to be ruling this out of order. Sorry, Councillor Paquette, because okay. the Councillor voted on that previous one, right? And it wasn't uh, a close vote. It was nine to four, right? So. Uh, uh, yeah, the rationale is different. Uh, do you mind if I if I challenge that? Let me just take it to a vote. So sure. Proce so procedurally, we'll just have the the chair read out the decision, and then you can challenge it, Councillor. Please. Okay. Sure. So I am ruling this out of order. Okay, I like to challenge that. Okay. I like challenges. This is the second challenge in 16 months, well, it, right? So <laughs> challenge. I just think this is such an important conversation. No, 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 no. I, 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 I respect your right to challenge the chair. I have no issues <laughs> with it whatsoever. Okay, okay. Now you tell me what we do. Um, uh, so thank clear. you, thank you for your patience there. So we're just putting it on the record that the chair has made a decision yeah. to move the uh, motion, the subsequent motion moved by Councillor Paquette out of order. Councillor yeah. Paquette has now challenged your decision. Yeah. And so I would suggest now that you you keep the chair in this instance. Yeah. Um, and then you ask your colleagues if the ruling of the chair is upheld. Okay. Because this is a bit of a different vote. All right. Now I ask if the ruling of the chair is upheld. If it's upheld, vote yes. If you disagree with chair's ruling, then you vote no. Am I right? Yes. Okay, if, please. In the positive. If you agree, vote yes. If you disagree, vote no. Yes. Okay, please vote. And I can disagree with my own decision? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I might rule you out of order. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Can I? Sorry, Is we have to negative? vote. So if you agree with the chair's ruling, you vote yes. If you disagree with the chair's ruling, then you vote no. Got and it. As no, there's no debate on this. Okay, so please vote. Mayor Soya, I do just have a question. Are these? Is this identical to the one that was defeated? Yep. No, Is no. That? technically it was not. The motion that was made before was a referral motion. It was a subsidiary motion, but it took precedence over the main motion. Wording is almost the same, yeah. not a referral motion. Therefore, it is just, it, we call the it a subsequent. Is, it's just the wording is, intent is the same. Okay, but the information that's being requested, those three bullets, those are identical to the three bullets in the other one. That that's is my right. Okay. That's Thank right. you very yeah. much. Okay. okay, all right, please vote.
So we just have to manually count because it's a different test. We're just missing two votes. So we're just missing one vote. Is not come to my screen. I'm um, yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay. So what is that? So this is. Hang on, hang on. One, Wait one moment, please. Okay. The opposite of what on the screen is true, the decision of the chair is upheld. Okay. All right. Okay. Any more subsequent? Well, hold on. I think I might have misunderstood the voting end. Uh, I thought we were voting no if we were challenging the chair. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you voted no, you did not accept the challenge you uh, you disagree right. with uh, uh, you disagree if you voted no then you disagree with the chair's okay. ruling yeah can, can we see that one more time the results okay so <laughs> if one third of the members oh it's not majority in yes. favor yeah. of the ruling of the chair it is upheld the yeah. test for the pass was five and the answer to the question was six agreed, so the ruling of the chair is upheld. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burkett. <laughs> Councillor Rutherford, do you have a subsequent? No. I was on for, que I was on for questions before. Okay. Any more subsequents? I am not asking. I'm not making a subsequent. <laughs> no. I'll retool that and bring back a very much different wording with the same kind of goals. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of making a subsequent, but the decision is made to uh, shift the burden to residential, so let's be it. Hey, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. That's it. Uh, why don't we take a break? <laughs> right? And be back at, uh, try to be back in 15 minutes, please.
like to call this meeting to order. Do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. <coughs> Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. <coughs> Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. <coughs> Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice. Here. Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans. Councillor Paquette, I saw you. You there? Oh, you saw me. I'm here. Okay. Councillor Jans, you're there now? Hello. And Councillor Hamilton is here as well. Okay. Okay. I think what I would suggest, recognizing that we had a pretty heavy discussions today, and we have some big items ahead of us, and I would suggest that uh, item 7.1 and bylaw 8.1 that we deal with those items on Friday. 7.1 could be the first item on the agenda and 8.2 could be the second and we, so that allows us to deal with some of the other items today. Is that okay, colleagues? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Sorry, but could you clarify? Was that 8.1, the noisy vehicles, or 8.2, the pedway? So 7.1, monthly update on operating budget OP12, first thing Friday. And then 8.1, the noisy vehicles bylaw, uh, will be dealt on Friday as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And the rest of the stuff we'll try to get through today. If not, then we'll go to uh, in the order. Okay. All right. So that will take us to... So can someone move that we bring forward 7.6, please? Sure, so moved. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote to bring forward 7.6. We're going to send out the vote in just two seconds. Councillor Kurtmel, can we just check if you're with us or not? Yeah, just to confirm, Councillor Stevenson, uh, we have Councillor Kurtmel is with us, Mayor Sohi, and Councillor Stevenson is just sitting down and she'll give yeah. us her vote verbally. Okay. We're bringing item yes. 7 6 forward. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we are on to 7.6, additional support for industrial development, Fulton Creek Business Park. This was, just hold on. Okay. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. So this uh, item was at, at the executive committee and we heard from uh, two representatives from the industry and uh, we had a very healthy discussion and the uh, committee made this recommendation to, uh, to council and uh, with that, I'll move the recommendation uh, that the revised council policy C 592A industrial infrastructure cost sharing program as outlined in attachment four of the February 15, 2023 Urban Planning and Economy Report UPE 01473 be approved to allow future eligible industrial developers to recover 100% of the tax uplift for over expenditure costs. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Would, would you like me to chair? Second. Oh, I, I second. moved it, so oh, you're second. going to be chairing it. Oh, I can't second. I'm chairing. 
You can. Yeah? Okay, yeah. I will second this, Chair. Uh, Councillor Wright, uh, did you have some questions of administration? Oh, and I'm sorry, is that a list of speakers there? So Councillor Tang? Oh, no, but Councillor Wright uh, exempted it, so I will turn to you first for questions. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess, Ms. McCabe, we had a conversation last week um, about the city plan and whatnot, but I did have some questions for you and I'm just wondering if you've gotten any answers back on, back on them about the uh, possibility of doing a gradual increase, like going 50, 75, 100. Yes, Councillor Wright, we have looked into that and um, it's up to Council's decision if you would like to do a graduated increase to the tax uplift repayment back to industrial developers. One thing to consider though is uh, one of the things with the recommendation uh, was to remove one of the um, financial barriers that our industrial developers were feeling. And so with the 100%, it removes that barrier quicker and gives them some certainty in terms of some predictability. What it also does is it repays them faster so that they can take that tax uplift repayment and turn it back into other industrial development. So if the goal is to increase industrial development quicker, um, going at 100% would allow you to do that. With that being said, it is your direction and decision as council if you would like uh, a different percentage to be used. Okay. So is it the goal? Um I, I'm, you're doing a body of work right now on the on the industrial land strategy. So I'm just wondering, do, should we wait for that information to come back until we actually know what the strategy is before going and, and putting the cart before the horse? Um, at this point, um, Councillor Wright, if that was the will of Council, of course we would do that. It's not our recommendation. We have identified this as a barrier and we think this is an important thing to do at this point. Okay, so I, my other concern then, um, or my other question to you was in regards to um, the urgency of this, um, and, and you'd indicated that there were some requirements in the MGA that it needed to be, the servicing agreement needed to be signed now. I'm not sure if Ms. Petrin's on the line, but the way that over expenditures work um, is that we can collect them, or I'll let you, Kim, if you can answer this question, please. Yeah, the, um, the servicing agreement it would be signed and then the developer is doing the construction which then triggers uh, repayment of the over expenditure. So there is an intent to uh, have that happen sooner as the developer indicated they're quite keen to move forward with this project. So without signing that agreement, they will not continue to move forward. I mean, they're doing quite a bit of work out there already. Um, they seem to be doing you know, the underground servicing there's holes dug up everywhere. There is a lot of work underway um, in, in that area because there's ongoing development in Fulton Creek. Uh, and what we've heard from the developer is that in order to continue to unlock land in the area that uh, this uh, policy exemption was being sought. But there's no requirement under the MGA that that it needs to be done now. Like we it's not a requirement under the MGA, but under a servicing agreement, the only time that we can collect money from a developer is a development permit phase um, and or at the servicing agreement. So because the servicing agreement is happening right now, and that's being triggered by the developer because of the timing of the development, this is the time at which we have to have this conversation with council. Okay. But I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is there a requirement that the servicing agreement be signed now? Or is it just yes. at, the, at the developer's request right now? Uh, there is a requirement for us to sign the servicing agreement with the developer right now because they are developing the land as we speak. And the MGA indicates that it has to be done. Like the, he couldn't, the developer just couldn't go ahead, do the work, and then at a later time, once we get this report back, be able to, to sign the agreement? Not the servicing agreement, but Kim, can you add anything to that? I wonder, uh, I'll pass to oh, Jamie, Jamie uh, who you, could Jamie. speak to, to this further. Yeah, I wonder if I could help a little bit here. So service agreements a condition of their approval. They can't proceed until service agreements executed. The MGA gives us the authority to enter into that agreement and to impose that on them. But, but they're at a standstill until that agreement is executed, which will keep them from doing any further development. That's, that's the pinch point here that can't be avoided. 
Okay, because like I said, it does appear that they are doing doing the work right now. Um, so I'm. I'm and so right, finished. they have some. They do have agreements for the underground work, I believe. So um, the the over expenditures are related to the arterial road construction. So there's a number of agreements that will go into place to advance this project. Okay, my time is almost up. I'll come back for a second round because I do have some more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Salvador. No. Uh, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this practice or this consideration of paying 100%, uh, is this something that's common across municipalities across Canada? The policy, the infrastructure cost sharing policy is somewhat of a unique policy across Canada. And so what it allows um, the city of Edmonton to do is to pay for cost shareable infrastructure um, through the developer versus taking on debt ourselves and paying for those costs up front, which is how most municipalities actually do this. Smaller municipalities don't typically have the large uh, infrastructure that larger cities like Edmonton um, has. So from a competitive standpoint, when you look at some of our regional par partners that surround us, this is somewhat unique to Edmonton. And that's one of the reasons why we, we're recommending bringing this forward now is because our industrial uh, development is increasing and at the same time our absorption rates are decreasing. So important that we get ahead of this now and can increase our industrial base um, as soon as possible. Okay, and is there any kind of like accountability piece, any kind of reporting from the developers side? Councillor Principe, um, developers are responsible as we've been talking about for the design and construction of the infrastructure. The engineering designs for that developer constructed must align with the city standards and with EPCOR design and construction. And then the work is completed by independent professional engineers in order for that to be accepted by the city and brought into our inventory. And then both the city of Edmonton and EPCOR review the designs to ensure they're accurate and comply with our standards. And so in order for the developer to receive payments from these over expenditures, we, they have to complete the construction and the work has to be inspected and approved by the city of Edmonton. So all the actual costs must be submitted to the city and are anything that's recoverable, we confirm. Well, okay, that's great. So there's a lot of oversight then. I see that. Okay, yes. yeah, that's great. Um, what about, I, I know you had mentioned that this is a barrier. What about um, timelines for permits? Is that considered a barrier as well compared to surrounding area? It is considered a barrier, but we have a client liaison unit that really works very hard to be able to make sure that we can meet a developer's timelines associated with that. And we have a few success stories in that area. Air Products is an example. Where we're able to get their permits in about 45 days. Um, make sure that we've got the right accountability, but we also want to make sure that we, people can build um, within our city within a timely manner. Yeah, that's a very good example, Air Products. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. So I would like to follow the question Councillor Principe asked. I, under I understand this is a common approach to have that sheer cost uh, model and for the financial and in the industrial development. Uh, but the question is, we are implementing that model and then 50% that is current policy. And right now, this um, change, policy change into the entire industrial area from 50 to 100. So the question is, do you know and then how many and municipalities across Canada have this 100% uh, percentage instead of just a different percentage? and from different uh, cities. Since this policy is unique to Edmonton, we don't know of any other municipalities that one have the policy or have 100%. What other municipalities do is they pay for cost shareable infrastructure up front and then have that the uh, developer portion of the cost shareable infrastructure paid back through a levy system. That's okay. traditionally how it works in other municipalities. Okay, uh, then when is our policy uh, was created? 
It was created in nineteen in sorry two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. Since two thousand seventeen now and five five years and six years, we only have four projects to actually request to use this policy. And is that right? There's six projects in total. So over right five now years. the increase. Correct. Uh, increase to six and so I understand the intention for this policy change to the to all the developers and then how do we measure the really outcome will achieve what's our goal and we want to do more industrial development we have we want to have the faster develop, development but how we measure that and it, but this is can can we guarantee the outcome will come as that way or is just our goal? I think, Councillor Reisel, I, I, I think there's two questions um, you're asking. I think the first is around um, how are we going to measure our success? And one of the, the, the simplest ways that we look at industrial development is our absorption rates in the city. And that's something that we take a look at on an annual basis right across the city. So we know what our um, absorption rates have been for the last 10 years, for the last five years, and the last year. And um, that's something we'll be continuously looking at, not only with this policy, but as we implement um, any changes that may come forward with the Industrial Action Plan, because all of the different elements um, should be working together in a system to increase our industrial development in the City of Edmonton. So I heard, yes, our city has a unique policy and mm -hmm. for the industrial development, but in the past, since this policy created, we only attract six projects for the development. That means average every year, just only one project. And then I don't know how this, does that mean because we only paid 50%, that is why we cannot attract more right now, we change to 100%, or is just this policy itself needs to look at it from a different angle for the changes? I don't think the policy itself needs to be looked at it from a different angle. I think the one thing it needs is what we're suggesting here is to the 100%. Um, but I think you're correct. We need to look at the entire suite of things that we're doing in order to incent industrial development. And that'll come forward in the industrial um, action plan. There's a Q2 update and then it'll become forward in Q4. So this uh, tool will be one of many tools that administration will suggest uh, to council for increasing the absorption of industrial development. I, I agree no, for that. Uh, I agree and specifically, and sorry, I have to mind for my time. I only have 35 min seconds, don't have 35 minutes. Uh, I agree and then yes, and we need to find a different way and have the different tool to support our industrial development. That is the, the key piece for economic development as well. But I do have concern and for from 50% to 100% in based on what the past six years and the experience our city use this unique, I use your words, and to, to attract uh, investment development. It seems to me this is not the measure or evidence to prove and this one and it will be change the percentage will be more successful. So I cannot say that guarantee there. Yeah, so we're, we're just at time, and I wasn't sure if there was a question in there, but perhaps we can, can come back. I think we would need a vote on a second round, because Councillor Wright, you had additional questions as well. I'll move a second round. A second. Please vote. Just missing two votes. Councillor Kurt Mel, are you still with us? And Councillor Paquette. I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We do have them. No. Nope. Yeah, we're going to mark Councillor Kurt Mel as absent, and we have all the votes, Deputy Mayor. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Uh, so, Councillor Wright, to you. Thank you. Um, so, at Executive Committee, um, I think 
um, those in the industry or whatever had been talking about, um, I think one example they gave was Amazon, um, that it was a better deal to build out in, in Leduc County. Um, what is their policy for over expenditures? Uh, typically what happens in other cities is actually the city upfronts the infrastructure. So and that's is, the case for Leduc? I, I'm not sure if we can speak specifically to, for Leduc. Um, someone will jump in after, but typically what happens is the city upfronts it, pays for under their debt. And so this is actually a really advantageous policy for our city in that the city does not have to upfront this, uh, the infrastructure. The developer upfronts it, the developer carries the risk. And in industrial development, the risk can actually be quite long because it takes a long time for those um, large-scale industrial developments to build out. So right now we've got, I think, about 16 million outstanding in over expenditures from 2019 when the policy first came into effect. And I think just under 10% is, is the tax uplift that we've gotten from it. So what is, I guess, what's, what's holding back um, those developers from, from generating that tax uplift? It's mostly market conditions in terms of how development overall has changed, not only in Edmonton, but globally. Okay, so like I said, the policy was 2019. I think we also heard um, on the, the, what is it, the, the Maple Industrial site, where they had come back in for an exception um, to extend their, their grant funding another four years. Um, and, and they had referred back to a previous report that was talking about economic conditions. So I guess I'm looking for some more specifics and, and that's what I was hoping that the strategy um, that's being developed would be able to tell me, you know, what, what is the best way to go so that we can incentivize um, industrial development. And that is definitely our intent when we bring forward the strategy. This will be one of the things that we'll be bringing, um, that will be part of the suite. Um, this is, uh, actually, I'm just going to stop there. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I would like more information to make an, an informed um, decision on this going forward. Um, and uh, Ms. McCabe, you'd, you'd also mention at Executive that you were the one that developed the policy at the 50-50, which to me seems to be a, an, an equitable partnership. Why now are we looking at more of one-sided with it being 100% to the developers? Uh, because the team has done some analysis uh, that uh, has uncovered that this will be more advantageous for the city in the long run. The scenarios that were illustrated at, um, at committee, I think, show that. And so I rely on the team to give uh, recommendations to me. I did not direct this 100%. Um, this was an analysis that came from the team, and the team that knows industrial de development way better than I did 10 years ago has said this is the best recommendation we have for council at this time. And that's all dependent on the tax uplift that we do get, which that, we've only correct. seen less than 10% so far. We still stand by the recommendation that's brought forward to council here today. Okay, well, um, I guess I'll just wait to speak to it. I can't support this. Okay, thank you. I don't see uh, anyone else on the board. Were there any further questions? Okay, uh, we will now move to speaking. So for those of you interested in speaking, please sign up. Councillor Paquette. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank administration and particularly uh, Ms. McCabe for this great work. Crawling into the old man Paquette time machine five years ago, uh, we were having this discussion and just couldn't see a path forward uh, to doing this. Um, and I'm so glad that, that we finally found uh, the mechanisms necessary. Um, industrial development is a tricky thing, especially here in Edmonton, surrounded by all of our uh, regional partners who also engage in industrial development and uh, offer their own sort of uh, incentives. In this one in particular, I, I've always liked, and I'm so glad to see it here finally, um, because we get made whole. And, uh, and at the same time, we become more competitive uh, as far as attracting uh, industrial development. 
So this is only uh, a long-term boon uh, for residents as far as being made whole, but it's also a short-term boon because we are going to be able to attract that much more uh, development. And as uh, Councillor Wright um, uh, so ably put it, receive that tax lift um, along with all of the jobs that that represents and uh, that uh, momentum growth. So again, just uh, thank you to administration for this and I hope uh, this gets uh, majority support. Thank you, Councillor Paget. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Oh, to cl oh, right, it's your motion, Councillor Wright. Okay, um, so I can't support the motion um, because of the resulting, I think, loss of potential uh, tax revenue sh and shifting it from, I, we just spoke in our, we talked about our last item about, um, you know, the, the shift in, in tax revenue from residential to residential, basically. And I think what this, what this is doing is it's shifting from industrial responsibility to the residential responsibility to that they won't be able to realize um, that that revenue from the uplift until 25, 30, I don't know how many years down the road um, once the developer uh, collects their, their over expenditures. So, and in my questions over the past few weeks and again today, um, I've heard some vague rationale that it's due to economic conditions, although I've never been given really any specific economic conditions over the past 10 years that um, has, I guess, limited uh, industrial development. And so I was hoping that we would get a more comprehensive analysis with the report and the work that the, the team is doing. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, 16 million in over expenditures um, have already been, I guess, um, granted, guaranteed, whatever, um, but yet we've only realized 10% uh, of the uplift from it. You know, are we really going to, um, you know, realize those, the, the, um, that tax, tax uplift going forward? Um, I don't know if, if there's any incentive then for the developers or, or second in developers to, um, to take on some of that responsibility from the initial developer. Um, and I think it's gonna be a long time before we, uh, residential property owners, um, get, that, um, get that benefit from the industrial uh, development. So the report itself states that it's difficult to predict and guarantee whether this financial support will create or advance new development opportunities. Um, so I, I do take that uh, with a bit of caution and I would encourage my colleagues, um, even though it was recommended from executive committee, um, to instead uh, consider, that, consider that we maintain the status quo um, until we do see the, the further uh, work that's noted uh, coming by later this year. And I think at that time then we can make a more informed decision as to whether um, this is the, the proper part of the strategy going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Um, so back to the 15, February 15th executive committee meeting, uh, I did ask some questions and also I did bring some concerns and then I, but I supported to move to council for the wider uh, discussion. Um, based on reflecting all the answers uh, for the question I had in the executive committee meeting and also today, uh, my question, the answer, um, I have similar concern as Councillor Wright has. Uh, but I do want to say our cities economic growth and recovery be faster, be more effective. I do want to say our industrial development and then catch the opportunity and the economic condition right now provided to us. But look at the data in the past several years since this policy created. I didn't say this uniqueness actually provided advantage to us for the 
industrial development. I'm thinking and then increase from 50% to 100% is the right way and to support our industrial development or not. And I don't have enough information to draw that conclusion. But I do believe there are many factors can impact how this development, this industrial development going. And specifically, um, last week, I believe, and we uh, did tour and in one business park in South Edmonton. And there one factor draw my attention really closely is about the permit process time. I think that creates a big barrier and for many investment and for the business. And in the book they provided, and the county of Leduc spent four to six weeks and for the development permit. And then Parkland County, eight to 10 weeks for the development permit. However, for city of Edmonton, is 36 to 40 weeks to get the development permit and the building permit. So this is just one example and then remind me to thinking, is there any other options, any other ways uh, we can look deeper to support our industrial development and sp specifically support our developers' business and in this industrial area. Uh, so I'm hesitant to make this decision and then to say yes from 50% to jump to 100%. And even I expected concern rights brought some like amendment say gradually to increase, but I didn't say that. Uh, with that say, and then I cannot support uh, the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Prince-Pay, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a process question. Uh, we do have a report that's coming back on this type of report uh, about the industry. We're just at speaking to, sorry. Oh, just at speaking to. So uh, it's, this is just about concerning my vote. But we're, we're into speaking, so I don't think we can ask any further questions. I can't ask this. a process question? No. Process, okay. we, sure. Uh, we always, it is up to the chair to permit process questions as we just did in the last. Yes. Item. Yeah, this is just a process, process. question. So if, <laughs> if um, this is voted on, if it fails and a report comes back to us within the next year recommending this, are we able to vote in favor of it? So the provision within the bylaw is that the same motion can't be voted on um, twice within the same calendar year um, unless there has been an election, which will not be the case. Um, however, there is always the option for council to undo previous decisions of the body as long as irrevocable action has not taken place. Okay, that answers my question. Thank but generally you. speaking, it's not good to be voting on the same thing twice within a year. It's right. a short answer. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go to Marisoli to close. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to take a moment to thank uh, our administration for uh, being so flexible and nimble and having the, uh, and the problem solving approach uh, uh, to this because this was identified by the uh, the developer and a huge challenge that they were facing and you took that uh, very seriously and you came up with solutions. So I really want to commend the flexibility that you have shown in, uh, in this. I also want to commend the work, uh, Stephanie, your uh, area. Uh, you won numerous awards from uh, uh, private industry as well as from the province of Alberta, how quick our city is compared to other cities when it comes to issuing permits and licenses and uh, how you are making it convenient and affordable uh, for people to do business in our city. So really want to acknowledge and commend that. Uh, you no, know, this is a win-win situation for everyone. Instead of us investing millions of dollars to upfront, uh, build the uh, infrastructure upfront and then paying their cost through borrowing uh, fees and others, right? In this case, uh, 
uh, you know, the developers pick up their cost uh, and know that uh, the front, the first developer in the area, uh, they construct that uh, oversized infrastructure to accommodate that future growth in the in the entire area. And uh, you know, it it, it sometimes is very difficult to recover those costs and take long, long time to recover those costs. So I think in this case. Uh, the adjustments we are making is that as you see the uplift in the in the value of the properties that we collect and that pays for that extra cost right so there's no net cost to the taxpayer right all we're doing is using that mini type of uh, uh, you know, uplift in the in the in the geographical area to uh, pay for that upfront cost, and I think that's the best way to unlock the industrial development uh, uh, in in our city. This is our, uh, uh, I would say, competitive advantage uh, when it comes to attracting more investment, industrial investment, and I think we need to support these kind of nimble, creative ways for our administration is working with the the development industry and. Uh, and this will allow, in this case, this developer to move forward quicker uh, and help us uplift that uh, 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 uplift in the, uh, in the in the property taxes. So it's a win-win for uh, uh, for all of us, and uh, uh, it really speaks to the uh, willingness of the administration to uh, uh, to work with the industry. And I hope that uh, uh, you know we may have. One question here, one question there, you know, a little bit of thing here, a little bit of thing there. But overall, I would encourage council to strongly support this approach because this really speaks to uh, our desire to grow our industrial tax base, really speaks to uh, reducing the dependency on uh, on the residential property, property taxes, and uh, it also speaks to being competitive and having that edge over, uh, over other cities, right? So I... Uh, uh, you know, all those little questions can be answered uh, in, in off-site conversations, right? So I hope that we all support this. That's it. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. We're just going to send the vote out in a couple of seconds here. I don't know the criminal. We're just waiting for two more vote. We're waiting for one more vote. I don't think Councillor Cartmel is still with us. We have all the votes, Deputy Mayor. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Okay. Thank you. I'll return the chair. Okay. All right. So. Mr. Mayor, just while you're considering the next item to deal with, there was actually a recommendation to be dealt with under bylaw 8.2. The bylaw did receive three readings, but after the bylaw was approved, I missed uh, flagging that there was actually a recommendation in the report. So we need to... Would it be possible? <coughs> we need to bring that forward? Um, I don't know if you need to bring it forward because you already dealt with, but if you could, somebody could move that. Yeah, that can someone move that recommendation, please? Uh, Oh, uh, this is the... I'll move it. Second. Okay. <laughs> okay, Councillor uh, Principe moved it. Need a seconder? Or oh, Councillor Wright seconded that? Okay, please vote. waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So 7.6 is done. 7.7 .7 we dealt with. Uh, in camera, right? Next one. Regional 
regional update. Right? Okay, can someone move that we go into private? So move. Second. Uh, Councillor Rice moved and seconded by Councillor Hamilton. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll give you five minutes to lock.
Sorry, can I ask why we're, are we not, are we recessing or what's going on? We're just waiting for a few seconds to uh, be in public. Councilor Jens, then we'll move uh, the receipt of the update for information, right? Regional update. Are we online? And then we will uh, recess till Friday. So we're online, Mayor Sohi. Oh, we are. Okay. Yep, can someone online. can someone move the uh, regional update, please, to be so received moved. from Councilor Rice? Moved it. Seconded. Councilor Second. uh, Prince Bay. Uh, so please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Jans. Yeah, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried, and we are on the recess till Friday, 9.30 a.m. Okay, see you then. Good night.